Constable when I met with them at the Serious Organised Crime Task Force uh, yesterday, and so action is being taken. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Paul Wheelhouse on the publication of the 2012 Greenhouse Gas Inventory. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. And I'll give Mr Wheelhouse a few seconds to gather his water, his papers and his thoughts. I now call on Paul Wheelhouse, Minister, about 10 minutes. And, of course, the important card. Thank you, Thank you Presiding Officer. I, I wish to advise members that the 2012 Green, Scottish Greenhouse Gas Emission Statistics were published this morning. The data in, indicate that Scotland has seen a 29.9% reduction in emissions of the basket of six key greenhouse gases between 1990 and 2012. On a comparable basis, using data published today, this contrasts the reduction of 23.9% for England, 17.7% for Wales and 15.0% for Northern Ireland. We also know emissions among all EU28 members on average fell by 18.5% and for the EU15 they fell by just 13.9% over the same period. However, progress towards Scotland's greenhouse gas emission targets is formally measured against the level of the net Scottish emissions account. For clarity, this account incorporates Scotland's source emissions, international aviation and international shipping emissions, relevant emission removals through carbon sinks such as forestry, and use of emissions allowances by Scottish industries participating in the EU Emissions Trading System, or ETS. Our annual targets were set using the 2008 inventory. Parliament envisaged at the time a 24.2% reduction in net emissions should be achieved by 2012 after adjustment for emissions trading. In fact, Scotland's net greenhouse gas emissions had, in 2012, fallen by 26.4% since 1990. In other words, our emissions trajectory is showing a steeper percentage decline than Parliament expected, or, or we uh, uh, met the, the percentage target by 2.2% in that year. However, the challenge to Scotland's performance is in terms of measurement against fixed statutory annual targets measured in tonnes. In 2012, unadjusted Scottish greenhouse gas emissions were estimated to be 52.9 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. This is marginally higher than the 2011 figure of 52.5 megatons, but as I stated earlier, 29.9% lower than in 1990. As the Scottish Climate Change Target for 2012 was designed to deliver a specific percentage reduction en route to a 42% decrease by 2020, but was set as a fixed value in tonnes at 53.226 megatons, so Scottish emissions in that year exceeded the level required by the annual target set under the Act by just over 2.4 megatons. This must be considered in a context of significant changes in how historical data are calculated, as well as new data which combine to add around 5.4 megatons, or a 7.7% increase to the baseline against which targets, all targets were set. This is more than double the amount by which the 2012 target was exceeded. Frustratingly, we are only informed of the changes now and could not be aware of them back in 2012. Details of how the data have been updated and improved are set out in the statistical release. Our targets are challenging, deliberately so, and year-to-year -year fluctuations in factors beyond our control are inevitable. However, it's worth noting that if the same percentage reduction, that is 24.2%, that had been envisaged when the 2012 target was set, was applied to the updated baseline using the 1990 to 2012 inventory, and the annual target was recalibrated accordingly, the benchmark of success would have been 57.3 megatons in 2012. On that basis, we would now be celebrating Scotland's emissions being 1.6 megatons below a revised 57.3 megaton target. In its annual pro progress report on Scotland's performance in March, our independent climate change advisers, the Committee on Climate Change, acknowledge good progress has been made in Scotland on reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, particularly in the energy sector and energy efficiency. In particular, a record on leading the UK on renewables, with 46.5% of Scotland's gross electricity consumption generated from renewables in 2013, is one we can be proud of. Crucially, they noted, despite having missed the first two statutory targets, underlying progress appears on track in most sectors. I believe Scotland's Parliament and Scotland's people should take heart from this. The trajectory is key. Having analysed the latest data, Parliament can be assured we are more than halfway towards our interim target of a 42% emission reduction by 2020. In addition to significant baseline adjustments, an increase in the net Scottish emissions account resulting from the operation of the EU ETS added 2.8 megatons to the 2012 account. 
This too is more than the amount by which the target was exceeded. And in 2012, again, arising from poor weather, residential emissions increased and energy sector emissions were also affected. This is a regular vulnerability we are determined to design out through tackling energy efficiency and decarbonisation of electricity and heat generation. There are hard yards ahead, but the second report on proposals and policies, or RPP2, sets the strategic direction to meeting our interim 42% target for 2020 and annual targets to 2027. However, Section 36 of the Act requires that if Scottish Ministers lay a report stating an annual target has not been met, they must, as soon as reasonably practicable, lay a report setting out proposals and policies to compensate in future years for excess emissions. I plan to address this by providing an annual report on the 2012 target by the end of October. The current RPP remains relevant and shows it is possible to meet every annual target. Some policies and proposals will be easier to implement than others. Technology is changing all the time. If individual measures don't work out, we would need to examine alternatives. Presiding officer, we are also focused on negotiations leading up to the UNFCCC conference of parties in Paris in 2015. As Jeb Sano of the Philippines has asked, we need to demonstrate Scottish Government's commitment to delivery of our stretching targets as our contribution to the necessary global action and to encourage others to higher ambition. We have engaged in discussions with Stop Climate Chaos for several weeks on next steps and I am grateful to uh, opposition parties seem keen to find consensus on new measures that arose from discussions with stakeholders. This positivity offers a hope of maintaining our common purpose as a nation in the face of perhaps the greatest global challenge. Therefore, I am pleased to announce the establishment of a Cabinet subcommittee on climate change to ensure coordination of our strategic response at the highest level within government. This will complement the new Public Sector Climate Leaders Forum and Scottish Government's Climate Change Delivery Board. To assist this process, I am making available a monitoring framework for delivery of RPP2 policies and proposals on the Scottish Government website, and I thank the Climate Change Delivery Board for their work on this. Be assured, this Government's ambition is resolute. I am confident our world-leading targets are driving the changes required for a smooth transition to a low-carbon Scotland. Scottish Ministers remain fully committed to delivering Scotland's ambitious greenhouse gas emission targets and the economic advantages of an early transition are clear. I regularly meet with my ministerial colleagues and I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge their significant contributions to the implementation of the delivery framework set out in the RPP2. For example, the Scottish Government and our agencies through the Heat Network Partnership we will build on the, the work underpinning the Scottish Government's draft heat uh, generation policy statement to commit resources to supporting delivery of district heating projects and we are actively engaged with projects across Scotland. Energy Minister Fergus Ewing has committed to set up a working group under the Expert Commission on District Heating to consider the existing regulatory context and develop proposals for a regulatory framework, including investigating how best to ensure public sector buildings connect to district heating networks where available and when it is cost effective. In March, new energy efficiency standards for social housing were launched and last week, my colleague Margaret Burgess announced the final home energy efficiency programmes for Scotland or HEAPS uh, allegations, allocations for 2014-15 of £60 million. This will result in remote local councils receiving £5.3 million more in funding for energy efficiency measures for off-gas grid uh, homes than was funded in 2013-14. We will work with stakeholders to take forward our commitment to target the most fuel poor areas in the years ahead, including remote, rural and hard to treat properties. On sustainable and active travel, we are committing uh, to achieving a target of almost total decarbonisation of road transport by 2050 and this morning the Minister for Transport announced a further £15 million package for the years 2014 to 2016. This included an allocation of an additional £10 million in 2014-15 to cycling infrastructure and more rapid deployment of electric vehicles and associated charging infrastructure throughout Scotland. This includes £7 million for cycling and walking infrastructure, which attracts match funding with £2 million uh, for electric vehicle rapid chargers and £1 million for up to 30 electric vehicles for car clubs. An allocation of £5 million is proposed in 2015-16 uh, by the Minister of Transport to develop behaviour change aspects of the Smarter Choices, Smarter Places programme. This will focus on locally designed initiatives, including travel planning, and will be designed to attract local match funding. It's worth noting the £15 million of funding targeted at reducing carbon emissions from the transport sector is 50% more than we had discussed with key stakeholders such as Stop Climate Chaos and indicates our determination to rise to the challenge. In agriculture, we have recently expanded the Farming for a Better Climate programme and have worked with Scotland's farmers to encourage the mutual benefits of uh, the common agricultural policy, from greening the elements of the common agricultural policy. The full detail of the CAP package will be announced by the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Richard Lockhead, tomorrow. 
It's no doubt because of this package of measures that Stop Climate Chaos Scotland this morning commented that this government was showing, I quote, serious intent in tackling climate change. Our Climate Challenge Fund enables communities to take action across Scotland, and we support international action on climate justice through our Climate Justice Fund. And it doesn't stop there. Our new Cabinet subcommittee and the Climate Change Delivery Board will develop policies and financial mechanisms to enable people, organisations and businesses to reduce their emissions while reaping the benefits. Through Public Sector Climate Leaders Forum, we've committed Scottish Government to become an exemplar organisation on climate change. And climate change uh, is a truly global challenge. Tackling it is a moral imperative. With your support, Scotland will continue to lead by example and encourage other nations to raise their ambition. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement, and I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we'll move to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question could press the request to speak buttons now, please. And if questions and answers are succinct, I might be able to call everyone who wishes to be called. Claire Baker. Um, President Officer, this is the third year in a row I have stood before the Minister and been disappointed by the Government Minister's statement to achieve in our year-in-year -year emissions target. And it's the third year I've heard the same excuses and spin from the Government. This is not acceptable. The Minister highlights the general trend, but since the Climate Change Act was passed and the statutory targets were introduced, progress has stalled and this year we actually see a rise in emissions from last year. The government defend the lack of progress by focusing on the shifting baseline, but this type of adjustment was not unexpected. And if I go back to Stuart Stevenson's comments on the 2010 figures, the then minister said, this early experience highlights the need to not just plan to meet the targets, but to build in some contingency as well. And if that had actually been done, we might not be in this position today. There is a need for action, and that's why I wrote to the minister, along with opposition colleagues, supporting Stop Climate Chaos policy asks. But we made clear that these would only be a start. I am pleased that the Minister has responded to them today, but we are not going to achieve the kind of step change that is needed. Today's announcement only makes subsequent years much more difficult to achieve. And as I share my concern over our ability to meet the 2013 target, which demands a significant drop in emissions, given that it will be based on the past and current activity, and that new announcements made today will have no impact on our ability to deliver on that target, and we are really playing catch-up. And while today's small measures are welcome, can I give a commitment that the annual report in October will be substantial and will fully compensate for the excess emissions? Minister. Um, well, as I presiding officer, as I set out earlier on, we will be producing a report by the end of October on our response to uh, the need to, to, to pick up slack in terms of emissions. But can I just uh, welcome the, the, the welcome from Claire Baker and part of her, answer, her question in regards to the measures we've taken. But I would hope she would recognise the serious commitment that's been put in by this government in terms of resources today and last week from Margaret Burgess and Keith Brown and the fact that we have set up a cabinet subcommittee which shows a serious intent to get, keep this, this government and this parliament's ambitions on climate change in track. I would highlight to Claire Baker, who talks about the ambition of this government and our, our uh, seemingly uh, inability to meet targets in her terms, uh, just to point out, and I'm, I'm having checked with John Swinney, in the seven years since uh, 2007, the Labour Party has never asked in the budget process for low carbon ambition to be one of its priorities. So I think that's something you ought to address to your colleagues. It has not featured in those discussions. So let's have a little bit more honesty and openness about this. I hope we can... Order, I, please. I hope we can have... Order. A, well, Order. Clear, Baker, you, <laughs> Order. Clear Baker's talking about excuses, but let's, let's get it straight. Each year, each year I, I, you, as you say, uh, Clear, Clear Baker says, sorry, presiding officer, I'm, I'm here, or my predecessors have been here, and she has criticised the Scottish Government's performance in climate change. And each year, the Labour Party has failed to ask for any further requests in the budget process. But we have, in, in this process, identified Order, additional please. measures. Order. Minister. I'm trying to, trying to listen to the dialogue and yourself, presiding well, officer. If I could stop you for a moment, Minister. Um, contributions from sedentary positions are not acceptable. This is a statement in question, so I'd be grateful if you just continue answering the question. Thank you. Um, I can assure Claire Baker, though, that we are serious about getting our targets uh, hit, if we can, between now and 2020. But the underlying trend, as I said in my statement, is something that should give us confidence, both committing climate change and, indeed, our own analysis suggests we are on track to achieve 42 per cent reduction. It is difficult because there have been sizable adjustments to the baseline. 5.4 megatons is a 7.7 per cent adjustment to the baseline. That is not an easy thing to overcome when you find out about it retrospectively. But we are working very hard to ensure we deliver on our targets. Many thanks. Jamie McGregor. 
Um, thank you very much. It's not third time lucky, is it? Um, given that the emissions from homes appear to have risen substantially in 2012, does the Minister believe enough is being done to support consumers insulate their homes to prevent heat being wasted, particularly elderly residents and those living in remote and rural communities? How will he increase awareness of the schemes which he outlined that are available, particularly with those hard to reach groups like elderly people living alone who are not online? Now, does the Minister feel embarrassed that the government has missed its fixed annual emissions target three years in a row? Is he aware that the UK's expert committee on climate change has said additional opportunities to reduce emissions that go beyond current and proposed policies will be necessary? And is he confident the additional measures he set out today are adequate to prevent us missing our targets yet again in future years? Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Um, on terms of the targets, I would just merely highlight to Jamie McGregor the targets of the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, I should say, collectively, we all uh, took them unanimously, uh, are more stretching than those of the UK. And uh, we have targets which set us a target of 42% for 2020, the UK's target is 34%. On the basis of the evidence published today, I would hope that Jamie McGregor could at least accept that Scotland's performance is far better than that of the UK, far better than that of England, far better than that of Wales and Northern Ireland. So we are making good progress. On the issue he fairly raises about energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is extremely important and I, I do accept the point that Jamie McGregor makes about the need to help those who are vulnerable and in harder to treat properties. We are, as my, I mentioned in my statement, Margaret Burgess has announced £60 million under heaps last week. £5.3 million of that is being specifically targeted through discussion with, with stakeholders to stop climate chaos at those hard to treat properties which are off gas grids in rural areas like the area that uh, Jamie McGregor represents. So I hope that Jamie McGregor will find something in that which is of, of potential benefit to his constituents as it will be to all uh, areas that are remote and rural across Scotland and those people who will currently find it very hard to have their properties treated will have additional support through local authorities funded by this government through our HEAPS programme. Thank you. Rob Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the light of the Opposition Party's contributions today, I would like to ask the Minister how he intends to engage elected representatives in our Parliament and in local government to play their part in meeting the targets we all agreed to and that all the parties require to contribute ideas to in order to meet our stretching targets if we are to succeed. Minister. Well, Rob Gibson is absolutely right. This is, uh, this is an issue that's bigger than normal politics, I, I suspect, and it's something that requires a, a consensus. So I'm disappointed with some of the early remarks that were made, uh, and I hope that we can have a more positive tone throughout. But I would say to, to Rob Gibson that we we all have a role to play in reducing carbon emissions. We are engaging with uh, families uh, throughout the length and breadth of Scotland through our Greener Together campaign, engaging people with positive messages of creating a, greener, great, a cleaner, greener Scotland linked to actions we all take. We know that about half of what we have to achieve is through behavioural change, so that is why that is so significant. We are engaging communities through the Climate Challenge Fund and the Junior Climate Challenge Fund with support of £11.8 million this year, enabling communities to deliver the climate change ambitions that meet their needs uh, of their communities. And we are engaging local government and the wider public sector through the Public Sector Climate Leaders Forum and Resource Efficient Scotland, which are targeted to the public sector and uh, business sector respectively. And this morning, as I said earlier, uh, my colleague Keith Brown announced £5 million towards smarter choices, smarter places, which is a significant investment to, to tackle behavioural change in transport uh, area and to reduce emissions. So I think we are taking the decisive steps that we need to take. I hope that we can get a consensus across this Parliament that this is a serious issue that requires mature debate and discussion and an understanding of the figures and take appropriate action. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, climate change is, of course, a worldwide issue, as the Minister has highlighted. It's also deeply relevant here in Scotland. This has been stressed by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation and others. In view of this, what is the Minister specifically doing to support economically challenged communities and households here in Scotland to tackle emissions and also to tackle fuel poverty and get a better quality of life for them at the same time. Thank you. Minister. Well, I, I certainly welcome the, the, the tone of, of Claudia Beamish's contribution here. We do have uh, a serious challenge. There are, I know there are genuine issues that Claudia Beamish has expressed an interest in before about equalities in relation to climate change policy, so I acknowledge that here today. Uh, we have taken action both on adaptation and mitigation to try and support communities that are at dis disadvantage, maybe perhaps in terms of their internal capacity to apply for funding through providing uh, development grants to the Climate Challenge Fund. So those communities in the bottom, 15% uh, of uh, social 
social uh, index uh, of multiple deprivation, Scottish index and multiple deprivation, are given specific support to provide them with the capacity to put in an application and to draw down funding through Climate Challenge Fund. That is beginning to bear fruit. We are beginning to see a broader range of communities coming forward and communities in areas that would otherwise be described as, as having uh, you know, uh, high levels of deprivation. deprivation. And more generally, we're trying to tackle the adaptation issues, as uh, I'm sure Claudia Beamish is aware, in terms of the study we commissioned through Dundee University to look at the impact of flooding uh, on uh, lower income groups. So we are taking a view that there's a climate justice agenda at home as well as abroad, and that we're trying to tackle the needs of our more deprived communities. And I'm happy to engage with Claudia Beamish on those issues as we go forward. Thank you, Graeme D. Thank you. Uh, whatever else these figures tell us, they surely reinforce the need to get the private sector and all public bodies properly engaged in the drive to create a truly environmentally responsible Scotland. Can the Minister outline how we can actually do that? And I don't mean getting chief executives committing to doing the right thing, but actually ensuring that from the top to the bottom of these organisations, we embed the kind of behaviours which will ensure Scotland hits future targets. Minister. Well, Graeme Day raises a very important point. We have uh, a need to, to make sure that there's a cultural change in business, uh, local government, uh, in public sector more generally, and indeed in Scottish government. We're trying to show what we can do as a Scottish government and lead by example. Uh, I am confident that local government is taking this issue very seriously, and I've had positive discussions with Stephen Hagan uh, and my counterpart in COSLA on this issue. But we also have opportunities through deployment of measures in the RPP2 and specifically the Low Carbon Behaviour Framework and ISM uh, individual, individual social material tool, which allows us to design policies across government to make sure they work with the, uh, the behavioural aspects of, of, of people's consumption behaviour and, and make sure that we try and influence uh, behaviour in those ways. So there's a number of tools we can deploy, uh, but it also looks at providing specific resource and uh, uh, material to local government, the Sustainable Scotland Network and other vehicles, Resource Efficient Scotland I mentioned earlier, to make sure people have got access to the information they need to make those decisions for themselves. And I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Climate Challenge is another way of helping individuals. And those are individuals that work in the workplace and then carry that message forward into the working environment as well. So there's a number of different approaches we need to take uh, to behavioural aspects of climate change. Alison McInnes. And I too am disappointed that we've yet again missed um, our targets, but I'm also disappointed that I didn't detect any great sense of urgency uh, from the Minister. And the first half of his statement could be summarised as, if only we'd set different targets or measured things differently, we wouldn't have been found wanting. I, it is serious. Consensus will only be won when we all believe that this government is doing its utmost. And I don't think that that is the case at the moment. One way to tackle emissions is to increase low carbon transport. And the Scottish Government should be leading the way on this. Can the Minister give us details of the current fleet of electric cars used by the Scottish Government? Minister. Well, um, I'm very disappointed, I have to say, with that line of questioning. Uh, we have just, I've just announced, uh, and Keith Brown, the Transport Minister, just announced £15 million investment in electric vehicle infrastructure, sustainable and active travel, and smarter choices, smarter places today. It would at least be good of uh, uh, the member to Alison McInnes to, to acknowledge this point. And rather than making a cheap, a cheap point. We have just installed a subcommittee of the Cabinet to tackle climate change, and the member accuses this government of not showing the necessary urgency in tackling the problem. We have more ambitious targets than her own government at UK level, with 42% for 2020. Where is the ambition from the UK government on a similar basis? So I challenge the member to say, come forward with positive solutions instead of cheap points, when we have made sincere commitments today on low carbon transport and electric vehicle infrastructure and sustainable and active travel. And it would be more fitting of her to acknowledge that point in her line of questioning. Nigel Dawn. Thank, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I, 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 I shall resist the temptation to go where the previous question did. I'd like to extend what uh, Graham Day is commenting on, on, on the fact that the, uh, the rest of, of England, Wales and Northern Ireland, and probably Europe, seems to be behind us on this. But of course, there are many businesses that work right the way across that area. And I'm wondering to what extent uh, we need to influence businesses and other private activities in such a way as they not only impact on us, but of course on those other countries where they're placed. Minister. Well, there, there obviously, Nigel Don uh, makes, makes some useful comments there because we do have to, to try and use what regulatory uh, powers we have across Europe to try and influence uh, business behaviours as well. And clearly, the regulation of key markets is a, 
is a key thing, the, the um, emissions trading scheme and uh, the trajectory that the European Union has set us on is also extremely important in driving business behaviour, particularly those in the traders sector, those that emit uh, significant amounts of uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, we do have a good performance in the context of Europe. We have seen 29.9% uh, reduction and, and as I said in my uh, statement, uh, EU15 it's 13.9% and EU28 18.5%. So we are uh, not necessarily uh, always going to be at the forefront in, in Europe amongst all countries because it will be chopping and changing but we are very much at the, the front uh, frontier in terms of European ambition. We need the UK to stick to its guns in its fourth carbon uh, budget which influences UK policy and businesses operating within the UK. We need the EU to move to higher ambition for its 2020 target and for the 2030 target we need at least a 40% um, uh, uh, carbon mitigation target and hopefully a 50% one if a world uh, global deal can be struck in Paris in 2015. Uh, Scotland's uh, targets by comparison for 2027, uh, earlier than 2030 clearly, are 60% or thereabouts. So we are showing much more ambition than our colleagues in Europe, but we do support the European Union and the UK when it comes to international negotiations and they can play a big role in creating the right environment for business to take the appropriate action. Cara Hilton. Uh, looking at emissions by sector, agriculture is the second highest at 11.2 per cent. Given the failure to meet our emissions targets and given the five asks that have been put forward by Stop Climate Chaos, why is the government's response on agriculture not much more robust? Minister. I said in my statement, uh, Cara Hilton uh, may, have not missed, may, may have missed this point. We are going to make a, uh, an announcement on the common agricultural policy tomorrow. My colleague Richard Lockhead will be doing so. Uh, and uh, I would just encourage Cara Hilton to listen to that statement and to read it and see what detail there is in there. Uh, I think she's being overly pessimistic, as, as, as perhaps maybe a trait of her colleagues on those benches, about the Scottish Government's performance. But she should have every confidence in our Cabinet Secretary uh, for Rural Affairs and Environment that he will, he will be uh, helpful in this regard. Well, we have worked very closely with Stop Climate Chaos to make sure that we uh, understand what they believe we need to do to get back on track. We've put our own uh, input into it. We've put more money in than they asked for on sustainable and active travel. And I think that shows a serious sign of intent on the part of this government to tackle this challenge. Christian Allard. Thank you, President Officer, and thanks the Minister for the statement which I read be before uh, he, he made it. And I would like to congratulate him for the 29.9% reduction in emission uh, the basket of six uh, greenhouse gases between 1990 and 2012, and particularly if you can compare with the rest of the UK. Regarding uh, emission trading scheme, I would like to know if the uh, Minister could develop and expand a little bit more on how it affected carbon emissions. Minister. Um, well, certainly uh, the emissions trading scheme is extremely significant because uh, approximately 40% of our total emissions are, are through the traded sector. So the performance of the emissions trading uh, system and its uh, trading scheme, sorry, and its impact on our figures is quite profound. The cap um, will decrease by 1.74% a year under the current uh, proposal across Europe, resulting in a reduction in ETS emissions of 21% in 2020 compared to 20, uh, 2005. By 2030, the Commission uh, proposes they should be 43% lower. Clearly, we have a higher level of ambition than that for 2030. We're talking about achieving a 60% reduction in emissions thereabouts by 2027 after taking into account the new baseline that we have. So we need Europe to go faster. And so we're constantly pushing Europe and indeed the UK's uh, line in Europe we support to try and get the uh, ETS to be more ambitious and to have a steeper trajectory for the traded sector to help keep us uh, on track to meet our targets. But in the RPP2, we've shown that we will move from 2021 onwards to recording actual emissions rather than ETS because we're we're concerned that perhaps the European Union might not yet get to the level of ambition we want to show ourselves. Thank you, Minister. I'm afraid if you turn away from your microphone and don't speak through the chair, I can't hear you. But then, worse than that, perhaps the official report can't pick up what you're saying. Uh, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. The first three targets, the failed targets, are the easy ones. They come before a big step change for 2013, and after that, an expectation of something like a million tonnes reduction every year after that, substantially more than has ever been achieved. Given that most of the initiatives, which are welcome from the government that has been announced today, have come from the NGOs with the support of the opposition parties, are we really to expect that big step change in our emissions trajectory without a big step change in policies? Minister. Well, we, we clearly have put in place, uh, and I'm, I'm welcome Patrick Harvey's uh, positive comments about the initiatives that have been taken today, as a contrast to others in the Chamber. But we have 
uh, certainly put in place this Cabinet subcommittee as a, as a reflection of the fact we realise we have a serious challenge ahead of us. Uh, the, the continual change in the baseline figures has made the challenge more difficult, as the Committee on Climate Change have acknowledged, and I'm sure the member is aware that is, makes it more difficult. In terms of the drop-off between 2012 and 2013, it is a substantial issue that we need to take account. We are pushing the UK Government. We haven't yet seen what the cap will be set by the UK Government in terms of the ETS, and we need to know, uh, you know what, what allocation we will have. But we are trying to reflect the need to up our game as a society. I would hope all members will engage in that positively, as I'm sure Mr Harvey will, uh, to take part in that. And we can uh, try and achieve this. But we are confident the underlying trajectory for 2020 is still on track. As I've acknowledged all along, we may have challenges from year to year, but we are taking the decisive action today to try and step up our, our efforts and make sure we accelerate investment in low-carbon technologies. And I welcome Mr Harvey's warm welcome of that. Willie Coffey. Thank you. The reduction in emissions of about 30 per cent in Scotland since 1990 is almost double that achieved across Europe. Uh, but what can the Scottish Government do to encourage other countries to match our ambitious targets in climate change? Minister. Well, I, th I think uh, Willie Coffey um, uh, strikes an important point because part of our, our role and one of the reasons why the NGOs have been so supportive are there are so few governments across the world that are showing the degree of ambition that we are. To be fair to the UK government, they are more ambitious than, than some others as well, so I want to give them credit for that. But where we can make an influence, because we don't have a direct voice at the negotiating table, is, we, is through bilateral, through engagement with NGOs, international NGOs, uh, international governments, to make them aware of what we as a developed country are doing. Uh, both in terms of climate mitigation and climate justice. The importance of that uh, cannot be underestimated because it's about trying to build trust between the developed and developing nations in an international context so they can trust developed nation groups like the EU, like the US and other countries when they come forward with the pledges on climate change. So we play a very important role in demonstrating that this can be done, not without its challenges, but it can be done, that it's good for the economy because we've got positive evidence from Scotland about how it's helped support the low carbon economy and sustain jobs at a time of otherwise reduced investment across the UK economy and how important it is to de deliver on climate justice as well. Jane Baxter and finally John Finney. Thank you. Um, given the, the contribution that can be made by the public sector, the community, voluntary and private sector to meeting our targets, does the Minister see a role for community planning partnerships in taking this forward and engaging with all the stakeholders? Yes, sir. I, I, I certainly agree with Jane Baxter. There could be a, an important role for all forms of uh, community planning in, in terms of it's a very important part of the, the uh, planning process for social and community infrastructure, in terms of investment in services, and clearly that feeds through into uh, perhaps some of the messaging that will then influence individual partners within the community planning partnership. So I do think, recognise that's an um, important area perhaps where it can be work. I have no doubt that Mr Mackay, my colleague through Bilaterals, is taking a close interest in uh, low carbon investment and its impact, and it's reflected uh, in the, certainly the draft um, Scottish planning policy and NPF3, you, you saw that, and then obviously it's fed through the consultation into uh, finalised documents. So we. We do have a recognition that there's a tie-up between the planning system and uh, the, uh, our, our low-carbon strategy through RPP2, and indeed, I think community planning has an important role to play in both. John Finney. Uh, first, I can apologise to you, President Officer, and the Minister for missing his opening remarks. Minister, uh, I welcome your comments on district heating, particularly the expert commission, and clearly that will require collaborative working, not least with planning and development. Now, you've assured us of coordination at the highest level. There will need to be the coordination at local level Will you, Minister, set out a time frame with specific targets regarding district heating schemes, please? Minister. As, as Mr Finney uh, may, may recognise, it's actually the, the ministerial portfolio of my colleague, Fergus Ewing, who's been very supportive in bringing forward this agenda. And I very much want to, to thank uh, Fergus Ewing for taking that action. We, we have an opportunity, obviously, to look at the current regulatory framework, uh, you know, how that influences the take-up of district heating what kind of regulatory framework, we might, regulatory framework we need in the future. I would certainly encourage those who have an interest in it to engage in that process. But I will uh, ask Mr Ewing perhaps to, to address that point to you in due course once further detail comes forward about the, the process for doing so. Thank you. That ends the statement from the Minister. So we now move to the next item of business. Before we do so, can I extend a very warm welcome uh, back to the Parliament to Nanette Milne, who is going to be leaving for the Conservative 
day. You'll see she's a sick, but I'm assured that in the very f near future she'll be gambling along like a spring lamb. Um, so the next item of business is a debate on motion number 10257 in the name of Shona Robertson on celebrating the contribution of older people to Scottish society. Can I just say to members that we... Um, do have a bit of time in hand today, so the presiding officer will be generous with time. Um, I call Shona Robson to speak to move the motion, Cabinet Secretary, 30 minutes or thereabouts. Uh, thank you, presiding officer, and it's good to see Nanette back. Uh, they've got something to live up to, becoming a spring lamb, but um, yeah, I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll, you'll cope, but it's good to see you back. I'm very pleased to uh, be opening today's debate that marks uh, the valuable contribution that older people make to life in Scotland. Uh, in April, the, the First Minister invited me to join the Scottish Cabinet as Cabinet Secretary for Commonwealth Games, Sport, Equalities and Pensioners' Rights. Introducing a, a specific brief on pensioners' rights is a, a practical demonstration of the importance this government places upon older people in Scotland. A Scotland where everyone has the opportunity to make the, the most of their talents. As the new Cabinet Secretary for Pensioners' Rights, I'm committed to ensuring the rights of our pensioners are fully protected, respected and realised. And I want today's debate to be very much focused on the positive role of older people in society. Our older population is a, a critical driver for creating the Scotland that we want to see in the coming years. We want our people uh, to maintain their independence as they get older and be able to access appropriate support when they need it. As well as being the right thing to do, it will enable older people to maximise their contribution to Scottish life and play an active, healthy role within communities and our rich uh, cultural life. When we talk about older people, we are not just talking about uh, health and social care services. Of course, older people have a, a valuable role to play. They have families, neighbours, give a positive contribution to their local community. They utilise services like housing, transport, leisure, community safety, education and arts. And also they shop and bank and uh, take, uh, uh, use other commercial enterprises. It's vital that we recognise this valuable contribution that older people make to the economy and to society more widely. We have more older workers than ever before, a rising state pension age and too many people dropping out of the workforce well before they are entitled to a pension. Early exit from the labour market can have serious implications for the health, well-being and incomes of individuals and comes at a significant cost to the economy, business and society as a whole. We want employers to embrace the challenge of retaining older workers and services such as the Scottish Centre for Healthy Working Lives can help employers get information and advice on the steps that they can take to support older people in the workforce. We should also, of course, acknowledge the vital and important role that grandparents have to play in the upbringing of children and young people. I certainly wouldn't have managed without mine. Um, the contribution of wider family and of grandparents in particular in the day-to-day -day care of children and in providing practical, emotional and often financial support to their own children is hugely significant. And of course, I cannot forget that this week being Carers Week, that many older people are caring for those closest to them. I pay tribute to them and reiterate this government's strong commitment to ensuring that all carers are supported. We're providing unprecedented levels of support, and this includes at least £46 million between 2012 and 2015 of the Reshaping Care for Older People Change Fund. Specifically, we're investing nearly £14 million for short breaks, as we recognise the difference a good quality short break can make to carers and those they care for. So far, over 25,000 carers and young carers have benefited from this resource. Shortly, we'll bring forward legislation within this parliament to support carers and young carers. And of course, under independence, we'd be able to increase the carer's allowance to £575 per annum. By increasing the carer's allowance to the same rate as job seekers' allowance, we'll bring to an end an unacceptable anomaly that sees carers, many of whom have had to give up work to care for a loved one after an accident or illness, awarded the lowest income replacement benefit. As newly appointed Cabinet Secretary for Pensioners' Rights, I will ensure support for pensioners is a priority for this government. As I said earlier, I acknowledge the positive contribution that older people make to the economy and where people want to remain working beyond retirement age, they should be able to do so. However, for many, this is a significant challenge. Last month, the Scottish Government published research showing that because of lower life expectancy, People with identical state pension entitlement but average life expectancy would receive substantially less over a lifetime in Scotland than in the UK. 
a situation exacerbated by decades of Westminster industrial and social policies which ravaged many communities across Scotland and have, uh, according to the previous Chief Medical Officer Sir Harry Burns, led directly to some of the lower life expectancies that we see in too many, too many parts of Scotland. Comparing Glasgow with the highest life expectancy areas of the UK, the differences are very stark indeed. £50,000 less for a man and £46,000 less for a woman. The UK plan to speed up the increase of the state pension age to 67 by eight years from the original timetable set out by the previous Labour government will only make the situation worse. And today's publication, in a minute, and today's publication of lifetime state pensions value by local authority area has revealed exactly how much Scottish pensioners are losing out compared to their peers south of the border. I'm struck that in my home city of Dundee, men are on averaging, averaging receiving £18,000 less and women £15,000 less. Yes. We have a card malfunction. On. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Mr. Sorry. Simpson. My, my apologies to you, Minister, as well. Uh, clearly, the life expectancy in Scotland being lower than that in, in the UK as a whole is a matter of considerable concern. However, I, I would ask her to make her comparisons with areas uh, of deprivation and early death in England where the, the results are exactly the same. So her comparisons are surely very parochial and false. Uh, no, I, I, I don't believe they are, um, and I believe it's our responsibility as the Scottish Parliament to want to do something about that. That's something I thought the Labour benches may have shared. So I'm therefore very disappointed that on the state pension age, all three unionist opposition parties in this Parliament choose to ignore the interests of their own constituents and instead take their lead from Westminster. The Labour Party, of course, before the last UK election, the then Labour government proposed a much longer timescale for increasing the pension age. But once the coalition accelerated the process, Labour fell silently in behind the Tories. The result is a pensions pay gap for the vast majority of pensioners in Scotland. For future pensioners in Scotland, clearly a no vote at the referendum on the 18th of September will cost an average of £10,000 as people have to work longer and longer. The simple message for pensioners in the future is, if you no vote no, you will be worse off. In Scotland's future, we have committed to establishing an independent commission to consider the appropriate rate of increase in the state age pension. The, the Commission will consider fairness, life expectancy, affordability and equality issues in the round and reach a decision that genuinely suits Scotland's circumstances. Hopefully something that everyone across this Parliament could welcome. And we know, of course, that social protection is more affordable for an independent Scotland. Total expenditure on social protection, which covers pensions and broader welfare spending, has been lower in Scotland than the rest of the UK over the past five years. Social protection expenditure in 2012-13 was 15.5% of GDP in Scotland and 16% in the UK. 42% of Scottish tax revenues were spent on social protection, compared with 43% in the UK. So uh, a better deal for pensioners is absolutely affordable. And a number of commentators, not least the UK government's own pension minister, uh, Steve Webb, have con confirmed that an independent Scotland uh, pensions would be, of course, safe. And uh, we are, of course, taking action to uh, mitigate the effects of the UK government welfare reforms, which, of course, affect many uh, older people. Um, the estimated cumulative impact could result in £6 billion reduction in the Scottish welfare bill by 2015-16. The solution is, of course, for the Scottish Parliament to have full control over welfare so that it can put in place policies which benefit the people of Scotland. At the moment, all we can do is to mitigate the effects of those UK government welfare reforms, which, of course, we have strived to do. Yes. I wonder if the Minister would explain uh, the theory behind her uh, proposals when she's asking us to believe that you can cut taxes, improve services and increase benefits. Let's, let's hear the logic behind that. 
it seems to be the messenger rather than the message. So when Gordon Brown cut corporation tax, we, the, apparently this was a good idea. And of course, maybe with uh, Gordon Brown's uh, demand for David Cameron to come north of the border and debate with the First Minister, maybe we'll get a change of position from the Labour benches on that as well. So we are committed to upholding the rights of pensioners in an independent Scotland. Meantime, of course, we continue to demonstrate our commitment to pensioners' rights through our actions under the devolved powers that we have with a focus on social and public health policies to address the underlying causes of poor life expectancy, whether that's supporting the smoking ban or, of course, reducing alcohol consumption. Providing high quality health and social care is absolutely critical to ensuring the contribution of older people to society uh, and to make sure that that can be maintained and enhanced. And, of course, protecting the gains this parliament has made under devolution on policies like concessionary bus travel and free personal care for the elderly. Let me outline some of the things this Scottish Government has done. We have maintained the NHS resource budget in real terms and not wasted time, money and energy on unwanted market reforms. And let me give this reassurance to older people. You can be sure that with this Government, the National Health Service will remain a public service, publicly funded and free at the point of need. Uh, very briefly. Uh, will the Minister accept the response I received in writing from the Cabinet Secretary that all the additional funds that are being put into the, uh, the National Health Service in Scotland between 2011 and 2016 are entirely the consequentials arising from Westminster additional spending? There is no additional spending from the core Scottish budget. It's all coming from Westminster. Will she confirm well, what the Cabinet well, Secretary said in writing? Well, of course, all of that resource, of course, is money that Scottish taxpayers have contributed to the London Treasury. So I think getting our fair share back is not an unreasonable thing to ask for. And of course, we have maintained and fully funded the concessionary bus scheme for older people across Scotland for this for us, this is an entitlement, a right for older people, and not a something for nothing um, in society. We've increased funding for free personal and nursing care and continue to regard it as one of the major achievements of this parliament and haven't uh, placed it on the chopping block as part of a cuts commission, as Labour, of course, have done. And we have increased funding on fuel poverty and energy efficiency by 40% in cash terms since 2007, installing over 600,000 energy efficiency measures since 2008, while Labour and coalition governments south of the border cut spending on fuel poverty. So we don't believe that these social protections should be dismissed as something for nothing. While Joanne Lamont's Cuts Commission continues to cogitate over a, rather a long time, but I'm sure we'll see the results uh, soon enough, we don't believe that these entitlements uh, should be axed. We believe that they are important gains under this Parliament. This Government is clear that not only will we protect these entitlements, but with independence, we can go further in providing the support our older people deserve. This is a record of which I'm proud, but there's much more that we could do with the full powers of independence on jobs, on pensions, on welfare, building a fairer country for all of our people, young and old alike. I've no doubt that many of the themes raised in today's debate will also be part of that day, and I hope members will engage with the issues raised. I invite members to support the motion. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call Neil Finlay to speak to move amendment number 10257.3. Mr Finlay, you've got a generous nine minutes. Thank you, President Officer. I move the, the, motion, uh, the amendment in my name. Um, I think what we've just heard is not so much a speech about older people as just another speech about independence. Um, Absolutely. President Officer, I'm very aware of the important role that our, uh, older people play in our society. In my seven years working in the social housing sector, including a spell in sheltered housing, uh, and nine years as a councillor, I witnessed at first hand the massive contribution uh, older people make in our communities. They're often the glue that binds the towns and villages together through their uh, paid and unpaid work, and their volunteering, their care and commitment are a great example to younger people, showing them that it's community activism, participation and solidarity that makes our society better and stronger. Speaking personally throughout my working life within my own circle of friends and family throughout the labour movement, the advice, the guidance and the encouragement of older people has helped me greatly. And from their lived experience, they bring a perspective that is vital to our collective well-being and understanding of society and how we develop it in future. 
Indeed, I believe we don't tap into this experience enough with too little intergenerational work being done. Such initiatives ensure that older people are able to speak to and interact with younger generations, building community cohesion and understanding. Of course, older people also contribute economically. Many are working longer in years and enjoying new opportunities and filling the skill shortages we have. And rather than being a financial burden, as they are often portrayed, they're a financial asset as well as an outstanding social asset. But it's also important that we consider whether we as a parliament, and whether the government and indeed society uh, is doing enough for our older people. And indeed it's imperative that we consider where we are, uh, whether we are planning well enough for future challenges, not least the demographic challenge posed by the predicted increase in older people and whether we are making our older people aware, fully aware of the consequences that could lie ahead should Scotland separate from the United Kingdom. Presiding officer, often today grandparents, aunties, uncles or other relatives are for various reasons being left to raise their uh, grandchildren or relatives uh, uh, in place of parents. These are often people in the twilight of their lives and they are the heroes, uh, among the heroes of our society. They need our support. Yet Scottish Labour's attempts to end the postcode lottery of financial support for kinship carers was rejected by the Scottish Government during the consideration of the Children and Young People's Bill. How much value did the Scottish Government place on those older people currently providing care and a home for their vulnerable grandkids or younger relatives? If we look at health inequality, what substantive action has the Government taken to tackle Scotland's shame that sees so many of our older people not reaching retirement or are in such poor health that they are unable to enjoy their remaining years? We know that one billion has been cut from anti-poverty initiatives. These were aimed at our most deprived communities where males have 23 fewer years in good health compared to 12 years in the least deprived areas. And for females, the figures are 26 and 12 years respectively. And isn't it to the minister's shame that her first statement when she came into post was about people entitled to more pension because they die younger and not addressing the issue of why they die younger. That's what we should be addressing. I just wonder if the member would agree with uh, Sir Harry Burns, the previous Chief Medical Officer, when he said the reason that life expectancy is low in many of those communities is because of the decades of deindustrialisation under the hands of the Westminster government. Surely he would want those powers to be in the hands of this parliament rather than see more of the same from Westminster. Neil Finlay. I agree with a great deal of what Harry Burns says. Unfortunately, I agree with very little for what the Minister says. <laughs> President Officer, Scotland faces a serious demographic challenge with the number of over 75 set to double in the next 25 years. As people live longer, we will see demands on our services, particularly in health and social care, rise. One Already we have seen Finlay, an impact. Mr McIntosh, you will have your turn in due course, so shush. Already we're seeing an impact. Across NHS Lothian, there are 26 GP practice patient uh, waiting lists, either full or restricted. Our a &E departments Mr. are full. Mr Findlay, could you just sit down a minute? Certainly. Ms McMahon, I am not going to have you berate me through this chamber. If you can't behave yourself, then please leave. Mr Findlay. Thanks, President Officer. Uh, we see A&E departments filled to bursting like we saw in Glasgow uh, last weekend where people and older people were issued with apologies for their overnight trolley waits. And nurses complained to me that boarding out of older people is an everyday occurrence. Our social care system is in crisis. In some areas, up to 20% of care home places out of commission due to concerns over poor levels of care being provided. In home care, we know that seven or 15 minute visits are now the norm. What level of care is being provided to our older people in seven or 15 minutes? And we know that staff budgets are being cut and standards affected. This all takes place, all takes place of course, against the backdrop of local authority budgets being slashed with 40,000 jobs lost, many of them in services delivered to our older people. Councils are forced into making decisions, these, uh, these decisions, and all the while the government ignores their call. Peter Johnson, 
I used to serve with Mr Johnston on West Lothian Council, SNP group leader and social care spokesperson for COSLA said recently, councils have been doing everything they can to protect social work services, but a difficult financial climate and a year-on-year -year increase in demand cannot be overcome through efficient and effective budget management alone. For once, for once in my life, I agree with Councillor Johnson. Oh, well, I'm sure he's delighted at that, Mr. Mr. Stevenson. Mr. Stevenson, please don't make remarks for a sedentary position, Neil Finlay. Stuart Stevenson and Peter Johnson, what a double act. Anyway, uh, what pensioners need is a health and social care system fit for purpose and fit to meet the demands of the 21st century. Why won't the Scottish Government rid itself of its complacency and do likewise to what Labour has called for? Call for a beverage-style review of our health and social care services, pretending that everything is OK when we have daily reports of unprecedented Pressures just won't cut it. And now, certainly, Bob Doris. Health and social care services. In April 2016, there will be integrated health and social care across Scotland. There was cross-party support from that from right across this chamber. This review that Mr Finlay is calling for, would you put on hold health and social care integration? Because that would be the consequence of what you're suggesting. Neil Finlay. Health and social care integration has been happening Come to West Lothian and I'll show you how it's been happening for the last 10 years. So we don't need legislation to make it happen. We need a cultural change to make it happen. And what about fuel poverty? Choosing between heating and eating is a daily choice for many Scots the pensioners not giving away during again, the cold weather. Mr. Doris. And we see an extra 2,000 deaths among over 65s, many cold related. Yet it was this SNP government that cut Labour's policy introduced in 2000 to provide free central heating and other cold-related uh, benefits and improvements for our pensioners, a policy that benefited around 80,000 Scots by reducing fuel poverty, not a mention from the Minister. And of course, President Officer, what about independence and its impact on older people? Scotland, we know gains from seeing our resources pulled and redistributed, where we pay less, less in than we get back. And we see the risk spread across 50 million rather than five. Of course, the Finance Secretary, Mr Swinney, has already admitted there would be a pensions black hole under independence. And he's right. Of course we know he's right. And then we have the latest cynical bribe, uh, bribe to our army of carers with a press release claiming 100,000 of them could benefit from an increase, increase in carers' allowance, despite the fact that only 57,000 receive the benefit at present and many would not gain anything due to the rules applying to other benefits. Add to this the increased uh, cost of a 3% corporation tax cut, equivalent to the entire amount councils spend on services provided for older people in their own homes. And the question has to be, how will these deep black holes be filled in trickle-down Scotland under the SNP? And rather than raising phony scares in our motion, why doesn't the Minister congratulate Labour for the policies she highlighted and that we introduced? Why stop at free personal care? Why stop at bus passes or winter fuel allowance? What about pension credits introduced by Labour? Free TV licences, eye tests, increase in the number of nurses and spending on the NHS, extension of lifelong learning. No, thank you, Ms. White. Uh, increase in lifelong learning, fr free central heating, Labour's energy price freeze that the SNP opposes because they would rather give a tax cut to their corporate donors. No, thank you. President Officer, Labour has a track record of commitment to older people. And it's for that reason that today I'm delighted to announce that the Provost of Fife, Jim Leishman, has been appointed as Labour's older people's champion and will sit with us in our wider shadow cabinet. I look forward to working with Jim and the older people of Scotland to develop a programme for a Labour government in a further devolved Scotland. <coughs> I now call on Annette Milne to speak to a move amendment number 102. 57.2. Ms Milne, seven minutes or thereabouts. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank you and the Cabinet Secretary for your kind words at the start of the debate and to congratulate the Cabinet Secretary on her recent elevation and extended role. It is perhaps fitting that the first debate I'm involved in since my recent hip surgery should be about celebrating the contribution of older people to society because it gives me the opportunity to congratulate my husband, elderly like myself, on his very effective role as carer in the early days of my recovery. 
I've, I've no doubt, however, <laughs> I've no doubt, however, that he's relieved that the role was a temporary one, because not all care for people are easy to please. And I'll leave you to guess which, uh, where I stand on that one. Today's debate is right to acknowledge the very significant contribution which older people make to our society. As paid employees, entrepreneurs, taxpayers and consumers, and as volunteers and carers. And this is particularly appropriate at the start of Carers Week. So I was a little disappointed, although I suppose not really surprised, as the referendum debate drags on, to read the sting in the tail of the government's motion, questioning the need identified by the UK government to increase the pensionable age in future years. Of course, Scottish Conservatives continue to support free personal care, as we've done since the outset, and we want to see the concessionary travel scheme not just continued, but extended to include community transport, because the present situation is unfair to many pensioners who cannot benefit from free travel because they do not have access to standard bus services. We also agree that carers should be financially and otherwise supported in their very valuable role and welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to increase the carer's allowance, as we state in our amendment. But if all this is to be possible and sustainable into the future, in the face of a burgeoning elderly population, any sensible government must plan ahead for its funding. And this, of course, is why changes to the pensionable age will be required. And the UK government is quite right to take this on board. But that government, as we heard in last week's Queen's speech, is also committed to introducing a private pensions bill and a pensions tax bill to help the pensioners of the future in planning for their old age. Most people, presiding officer, realise that there really is no such thing as a free lunch and simply do not buy into the SNP's myriad uncosted promises. With regard to the amendments, we'll support the Liberal Democrat one, but I'm afraid we cannot support Labour's amendment simply because of its call for a review of the NHS in Scotland, which we have already opposed. I'd now like to turn to the celebratory part of the debate and acknowledge the immense contribution which older people make to Scottish society. The Royal Voluntary Service has estimated that the economic contribution alone of over 65s in 2010 was worth £40 billion and that this will rise to £77 billion by 2030, an enormous sum in anybody's book. Employers are increasingly recognising the value of older workers and encouraging their employment to the extent that Age Scotland has this year created an Employer of the Year category in its annual awards scheme. Many professional people continue to play a valuable role after retirement. In the NHS, for instance, particularly in general practice, retired doctors working as locums plug many staffing gaps, covering for holidays or allowing GPs time off for training or professional meetings. This not only benefits the NHS, it also allows the doctors to continue the medical work they were trained for without the burden of administration which besets so many senior GPs in the modern world. And my colleagues who have, who have locum experience all say how enjoyable that has been. We're all familiar with the co contributions still being made by Professor Hugh Pennington in the field of bacteriology, using his knowledge and experience in the battle against Campylobacter and E. coli 157. And just the other evening, I learned that Professor John Mallard, the inventor of the MRI scanner, went on after retirement to develop the positron emission tomography, eh, the PET scanner so widely used today. I was incidentally also delighted to learn that John's prototype MRI scanner is to be preserved and displayed permanently within Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, a fitting tribute to a man whose immense contribution to society worldwide has never actually had the public recognition which it deserves. Presiding officer, volunteers, as we've heard already, are essential to our society and older people are widely recognised as some of the most active local volunteers as good neighbours or active residents. The 2008-09 Citizenship Survey found that a third of people aged 60 to 74 and a fifth of those aged 75 and over undertake some formal volunteering in their community. This led me to think about my contemporaries in my own local area in Aberdeen. My next door neighbour joined the children's panel when he retired from the oil industry. A close friend continues her long involvement with Citizens Advice Scotland. Other neighbours run our local neighbourhood watch schemes or play an active role as community councillors. Others produce and deliver our regular community newsletter and a group of older people run our annual community festival. 
Cancer patients rely on the support of volunteers working as friends of Roxburgh House or with CLAN, a well-known and very active local cancer charity. And many of my age group do regular fundraising for these and other charities, such as Marie Curie, the anchor unit of the Maggie Centre, not to mention guide dogs, lifeboats, the Serenians, and many other organisations. Hospital patients and housebound people have come to rely on the RVS for the provision of refreshments and wards and clinics, and the social contact provided by volunteers, many of them retired, who deliver meals on wheels to people um, who rarely have visitors from the outside world. Presiding officer, I've given just a few examples of the extent of volunteering in my own area. Just think of the contribution of volunteers to Scottish society as a whole when such activities are multiplied across all our local communities. Add to this the enormous contribution grandparents make to childcare in Scotland today and the number of older people willingly and lovingly caring for their partners, friends or neighbours. And we realise just how much we rely on older people to support the fabric of our communities and how much resource they save the public purse. So we should not regard the elderly as a burden, but rather we should celebrate their role in contributing to, to, contributing to a cohesive and caring Scottish society. I move the amendment in my name. Uh, thank you, Ms Milne. It is good to have you back. Um, can I, before I call on Jim Hume to speak for the Liberal Democrats, can I just give an indication at this point to the backbench speakers uh, that we can give you each seven minutes and if you take interventions, you might get a bit longer. I call Jim Hume. Mr Hume, seven minutes or thereabouts. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, too, say it, must state it's good to see Nanette Milne back in the chamber. Uh, I start by, of course, moving the amendment in my name. As members have already said this afternoon, older people do enrich our communities. They contribute a wealth of knowledge and, and support to family life, and as that population grows, it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure older people are looked after as they become more reliant on health care and other support services. The Scottish Government is uh, correct that we should celebrate the contribution of our older people, and this year's Normandy commemorations were an emotional uh, reminder of what older people bring to society as a living link to our past. It's correct to acknowledge the positive impact of concessionary bus travel and free personal care, policies brought about under the Liberal Democrat Labour coalition. But the Scot Scottish Government motion would have us believe that all is well in the care of older people. And sadly, that's not the case, as highlighted by the recent Mental Welfare Commission's depressing report into the care of dementia patients. For far too long, Lib Dems have been warning that older people are being let down by this government's confused priorities. Figures we obtained recently show that emergency emissions for older people are increasing further, whilst the number of staff hospital beds has plummeted. In an answer to a parliamentary question, the Health Secretary himself confirmed that the number of geriatric beds are at their lowest level in over 10 years. The Health Secretary answer shows that emergency emissions for older people is also at its highest in over 10 years. That's a huge imbalance, imbalance between supply and demand. This government's failing to meet the national indicator to reduce emergency admissions to hospital. And these figures come just after one week after an audit Scotland report found that at least 90% of patients, 90% of patients experience a delay of more than three days were aged 65 and over. Sadly, older people are being let down by the government's confused priorities. The fact is that at a time when people are living longer lives and for longer in periods of ill health, the Scottish Government continue to slash the number of staff beds for older people. This is despite the number of unplanned, unplanned emergency admissions for people aged 65 increasing by around a fifth over the same period. With an ageing population, it's not necessarily surprising that emergency admissions for older people have increased. But this government are cutting beds drastically without improving social care and support. This only puts more pressure on an NHS already being asked to do more and more. The SNP's short-term approach to the stewardship of our NHS could have a long-term negative impact on patient care. It's bad for patients and for our NHS resources when beds are used by patients who are clinically ready to leave hospital. 
Sorry, I'll take an intervention. Presume Member, very much. Uh, you are aware that the DWP has kept £270 million since we introduced free personal care. Do you think we should have that paid back to us so we can help provide uh, better support for our pensioners to become frailer? I'll come Jim, to Jim. some many points at my very end of exactly how much support the Lib Dems in coalition have been given to older people in Scotland, amounting to nearly three quarters of a billion pounds. The Health Secretary's position on continuing care is hugely disappointing. The Health Secretary has refused to admit that changes to the policy announced in May would mean that people will only qualify for free accommodation if they are being cared for in an NHS hospital. The Government's own independent review published at about the same time, it recommended that any patients receiving NHS continuing care after 2015 would no longer be able to have accommodation costs paid for in care homes. This could affect hundreds of patients. In England, more and more people are qualifying for NHS continuing care. This is in contrast with patients in Scotland, where health boards have seen a year-on-year -year decline, leading to claims that many people with complex care needs were paying for care homes when they were entitled to have it paid for by the NHS. Many people do not want to spend lengthy periods or, in some cases, the rest of their lives in hospitals. If, if it is the case that patients with complex care needs will no longer have accommodation costs paid for in care homes, then people will be astonished. If anything, this will mean that people will have every incentive to stay in a hospital bed. This stands at complete odds with this government's claims it wishes to transfer care into the community. When it comes to tackling health inequalities, the SNP have a stop and start approach with a two year break between updates on the progress of the report and no updates in nearly a year from the Ministerial Task Force. The statement published recently by the Scottish Government on health inequalities failed to mention any specific projects it is funding to reduce inequalities in Glasgow, where life expectancy is amongst the lowest in Scotland. I wonder if the member can reconcile some of the welfare reform which is reducing uh, the, the money uh, that people have to support them. Do you think that helps or hinders health inequalities and the tackling of them? As, as the Minister will be well uh, aware, and I will come on to pensions in, in the very near future, the amount that has been increased in pensions is amounting to nearly three quarters of a billion pounds in Scotland alone. The statement, the SNP seem to have forgotten their priorities, they are confused again. People are dying earlier in Scotland, and instead of coming up with solutions for how we can help more people live longer, healthier lives, ministers here today have hit the calculator to work out how much pension they will miss out on. We as Liberal Democrats warned the Scottish Government that they needed to do more after they put their Equality Well Action Plan on the back burner for five years. We shall be supporting the Conservatives today uh, with their amendment, but unfortunately not Labour due to the fact that we do not think the NHS should be put on hold whilst there is a complete review of it. But, uh, unfortunately, but as uh, Richard Simpson knows, that is my position. But anyway, Sanders, it's a pretty bleak aspiration to simply lower pension age rather than tackle our health inequalities. Lib, Dem Lib Dems have tackled age discrimi discrimination in the workplace by abolishing the compulsory age of retirement. This means that workers can no longer be forced to retire just because they have reached their 65th birthday, as well as allowing people more control of how long they work for. This change also sends a powerful signal that older people should be valued at work and can share their important work experience with colleagues. If this government wants to see how to celebrate our older people, just look to the Lib Dems in coalition who have delivered a triple lock guarantee to pensions amounting to £800 more per year for 890,000 pensioners in Scotland. That's some £712 million back in the, in the pockets of our older people in Scotland. Thank you, Mr Hume. We do move to the uh, open speeches. I call Sandra White to be followed by Margaret McCulloch. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And can I also welcome Lynette Milne back to the Chamber, to the Parliament, and uh, thank her husband for looking after her uh, so well. And uh, welcome back, welcome back, Lynette. <laughs> Uh, presiding officer, today's debate is about acknowledging the contribution older people make to Scottish society, be it economically through the contribution they make to caring, to the civic contributions they make to local organisations through their work in their community, and also, as has been said previously, 
the older people, if they want to, are able to work on, and perhaps there are some people in this chamber who are in that category and uh, obviously contribute to the economy. But I, I do want to touch on something which was said from the, the Labour benches, and I don't think we in this place can need to take any lessons from the Labour benches. When you look at uh, Gordon Brown and how he raided the pension pots, uh, we don't need any lessons from there, and he did raid them. And then we talk about you know, concessionary fares, which is absolutely fantastic, and all the other introductions. And yeah, I pay tribute pre-personal care. I mean, I'm not being political in this particular part. I pay tribute to that, Order, that it was please. brought forward. But, but you, cannot, you cannot say that we would say to the Labour Party, well done for doing that. Then you come in with Joanne uh, Lamont and say, cuts commission. We should take all of that away. And you have to be absolutely honest with yourself. The cuts commission is about taking that away. So please don't, don't lecture us on anything at all. And if I could just uh, carry on, perhaps in that theme, which I, I didn't carry want on to, the I, through the chair, please. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to carry on that theme, but I don't think we can let it absolutely go at all. You know, it, it really does sadden me uh, that the amendments we have before us, and uh, from of her so far from some members, far from celebrating the contribution of of older people, they seem intent on continuing to focus on, focus on older people as burdens, uh, a problem. With little respect to the countless older people who make an invaluable positive contribution to our society each day. And I was a wee bit confused with uh, Jim Hume's uh, contribution uh, when he mentioned the fact that people are, are uh, you know, not living long enough, but then people are living too long. So I, I just would like to question... Yes, sure, I'll take it. Neil Finlay. Sorry, could I have Neil Finlay's microphone, please? She says we don't refer to the contribution of older people. We leave that part of the motion in. You do understand that? That we leave Sa that part Sandra of the motion White. in? I I, I, I agree it's in the motion, but it certainly wasn't what was said. I mean, basically, it certainly wasn't what was said. I, I think people are living longer is something to celebrate. I think it's something positive, is it not? That we're actually living longer. But then we've got the contradictory terms that people are uh, dying younger. And it's been decades. And I must admit, my home city of, my home city of Glasgow, Labour controlled. <laughs> Nothing has been done in the decades they've been in control to try and get rid of the poverty within my fair city of Glasgow. I'll take an intervention. Jim Hume. I, I, th I, th I thank the, the member for taking an intervention uh, uh, because she did mention my name and, uh, and said she was a little confused. I'm sorry, Sandra's a, a little confused, but we are really concerned about the health inequalities. Uh, now, health has been um, devolved for 15 years, uh, uh, but uh, would you recognise some of the good that the coalition has done in pr bringing in an extra £712 million to 890,000 pensioners in Scotland? Thank you, I'll give you some uh, time thank, thank you, presiding officer. As I said before, I'm not being political in this particular aspect, but you have never congratulated anything this Scottish Government has done to alleviate the problems that not just pensioners have, but poverty households as well. And if there's more money being spent and health has been better, of course people will live longer, and I think that's something we should be celebrating. And I, and I, I don't mind saying that at all. And I think this is at the heart of the issue of the debate that we're having today. Uh, we need to change the way society perceives older people they're an asset rather than a burden, and we have a chance to do that today. And I really do sincerely hope that we do take that. Now, presiding officer, two weeks ago I had the pleasure of hosting a reception for the Annex Connects project, which is based in my constituency in Glasgow Kelvin. One of the first projects to receive a grant from the Big Lotteries Investing in Communities Fund way back in 2011. Fantastic day. Ended up with all of us outside singing, waving flags, etc. And they absolutely enjoyed it so much. Now, the project works with vulnerable and isolated older people in the local area to help them to reconnect to their community through various activities. And it's been a really good success, so much so it's been emulated by others also. And, you know, some of the comments were absolutely fantastic. Friendship and love, this is what we've found here. We don't need to sit in the house anymore. We're able to get out. One elderly lady says she goes to meditation to get Reiki treatment, and she goes there every day. Why not? She should be able to do that. And I think it's, it's fantastic to see them all so full of life. And, you know, this is, at this point... A lot of the debate today focuses upon the economic arguments surrounding an age of population. I've said that before. But I believe it's equally important to look at the type of projects such as I've mentioned and the tangible benefits they bring to the lives of older people and learn from those examples. Uh, older people are not just assets or burdens to be bandied about. They're real people, and we should be respecting them and remembering that today. 
And that's one of the reasons I too welcome the publication of Somewhere to Go and Something to Do, Active and Healthy Ageing, the Action Plan, which does identify the need to share examples of uh, projects at work and people who benefit from them. And we can learn from that. You know, however, whilst all the priority themes and actions identified in the report will clearly benefit older people, I'm a wee bit concerned as how the projects such as the Annex Connect projects, what I've spoken about, uh, will fit into the plan. And I know members here today will have, you know, visited many grassroots community-based projects which do assist older people and how we can learn from these hundreds of examples, how we can actually feed in, perhaps, Minister, to that plan. And I do acknowledge that uh, it's important to take a top-down approach to address certain issues facing older people. I do think we need to make more effort to ensure that as much focus is given to the bottom-up approach. Now, as convener of the cross-party group on older people age and ageing uh, in the Parliament, one of the oldest uh, cross-party groups, you pardon the bun, uh, in the Parliament, it's something that I want to raise with the cross-party group with a view to exploring at future meetings and... Uh, perhaps look at the findings that we have of that uh, project and be happy, if the Minister so wishes, to report these findings back to the Minister. Now, in fact, tomorrow we have an AGM, so like someone's shamefully plugging their new book, members here are, who are interested in the uh, issues affecting older people, I know there are certain members here today, uh, are more than welcome to come along as we discuss our future work programme. Presiding officer, uh, we'll all be old one day, uh, some of us sooner than others. <laughs> and, and when debating this issue today, we should treat it with respect, uh, basically because for uh, that will be one of us one day. Thank you very much, presiding officer. And thanks, Margaret McCulloch, to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, presiding officer. Older people are not a homogenous group of people defined simply by their age or their pension. They're carers, activists, volunteers, workers, grafters, students, teachers, employers, investors, artists, engineers, makers and creators. And they're also mothers and fathers and their sons and daughters. Many of them have already played their part in shaping our society. And with older people still consistently more likely to vote than any other age group, they continue to do so. If any message goes out from this Parliament this afternoon, then let it be that we do not just recognise the contribution older people make, but that we are very thankful for it. They are an asset, not a burden, and by valuing their skills, their talents, their potential and their experience, we can enrich our society, better educate the young and provide dignity and opportunity and fulfilment well into later life. Presiding officer, I want to bring to the Chamber's attention an example from Germany on how the oldest generation can make a difference to the youngest. It's a unique example with a beautiful simplicity behind it. It's, a, and excuse me if I don't pronounce it properly, Meher Generationale Haus. Literally translated, it means multi-generational house. Across Scotland, in our towns and cities and villages, we have community centres hosting all kinds of activities and providing all kinds of facilities. Day centres for pensioners, nurseries for children, meeting point for communities, family centres to give advice to parents on the health and well-being of their children. But is it always right to compartmentalise the community in that way? Since 2006, Germany have been looking at how to bring just some of those different services aimed at different groups of people under one roof. One article I read tells the story of a young girl called Emily and her great-grandmother. They both make the same journey to the same place every week. But while Emily goes to the Salzgitter Child Care Centre, her great-grandmother great receives treatment for dementia at a day centre across the hall in the same building. And there's an open-door policy between the two. Salzgitter was a model for the multi-generational house and it's a model which is now growing and developing all across Germany. Pensioners can volunteer to get involved in the kindergarten, looking after the children, reading books, playing and singing and bridging the gap between the generations. And in a world in which families increasingly live further and further apart, children who may not see their own grandparents often can learn from older people who act as a positive role models. As the model is spread out in Germany, there are common public places emerging where the different generations can socialise and interact in the same place, 
bistros, cafeterias, libraries and lounges. The knowledge and experience of the older generations doesn't have to be lost to the next. Likewise, the knowledge and experience of the young doesn't have to remain ailing to the older people. That's a lesson from Germany, and it's a lesson we could do well to learn here in Scotland. Of course, we cannot debate the future of older people in our society without dealing with the choice we will all have to make on the 18th of September, which is alluded to in a clear and comprehensive Labour amendment. When it comes to dealing with health inequalities, life expectancy, the stability of our pension systems and the resourcing of our public services, I believe that devolution provides the best way forward. We have a strong Scottish Parliament growing stronger, taking decisions here about health and social care, while we also share risks, rewards and resources across the whole of the United Kingdom as part of a redistribution social union. It's the best of both worlds for Scotland's pensioners, and the best of both worlds is best for Scotland. I'm just finishing now. Presiding officer, we all age, but with innovation from government, creativity in our public services, and the pulling and sharing to provide strength, security and stability for Scotland's pensioners, then I hope that more and more of us can age well and age well together. Thank you. Thank you. Can I remind members that they can have up to seven minutes for their speeches and there is a little bit of extra time for interventions. Christine Graham to be followed by Stuart Stevens. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I say to Mar Margaret McCulloch to add to her list of diverse activities of pensioners, MSPs even. Yeah, yeah. I'm very pleased to take part in this debate to declare an interest being an older person. Ich bin ein Pensioner, to plagiarise, of the Elvis Beatles vintage. Yes, I once wore a miniskirt. That's changed, but the hair hasn't. Now, I know the Labour amendment, although there was some early introduction about the benefits and the assets, it actually refers to demographic challenge. I don't see myself or my generation as any kind of challenge, rather an asset, no more or less a challenge or an asset than any other age group. I think of... Saturday and B&Q, who obviously see pensioners as an asset, not just because they give them 10% discount on a Wednesday, and by the way, just because I've mentioned them, I'm not wanting 15%. But I was even asked then if I wanted to do a part-time job there to join the band of pensioners uh, who are excellent. The electrician, the retired electrician, who can tell you what to buy, the retired joiner. And while there's not yet a vacancy there for me at the moment, should there be in the future, and this is not an intimation of any plan in the coming years, years, I could see myself useful in the plant and gardening section. On Sunday, <laughs> on Sunday I was in charge of my granddaughter, age three, uh, for what was a marathon, I can assure you, five hours. My repertoire of finger painting, drawing, cutting out, storytelling, seed planting, watering plants, and more storytelling was occasionally and mercifully interspersed with rest periods watching Cinderella, or she will have it, Cinderella, for the umpteenth time. So, like many grandparents, I am that child caring asset that the Cabinet Secretary and others have referred to. But of course, the great concern for pensioners and for elderly is their pension, now and in the future. We had scare stories from Westminster in the event of a yes vote, their pensions, their state pensions, would be at risk. No sooner was that out in the ether than we have, as the Cabinet Secretary said, Steve Webb saying, no, your state pension will continue to be paid because the last time I looked, it's an entitlement, not a benefit, something we have subscribed to. Speaking to my gas engineer as he assessed my combi, I lead a very exciting life, yesterday, he asked me about his occupational pensions in the light of a yes vote. Of course, occupational pensions are a matter of contract. And whether you're living in an independent Scotland or seeking summer climbs to get away from those debilitating energy bills, both state and occupational pensions will be paid. Sunny Cyprus or less sunny Scotland. It's all one and the same. Your pensions are a contract, they are payable. So let's put that to the side. For the... Yes? Ken McIntosh. Thank you, President Officer. Much as I agree with the general tenor of what Ms Graham is saying about uh, 
older people certainly being a, an asset to our society, does she not accept that there is an issue about dependency ratio, which we do have to face up to, that Scotland is going to have a worse dependency ratio than the rest of the UK, unless no, we address and, that and issue? We're also Christine not putting, I beg your pardon. What, what the member is also not putting into the mix is the free services that pensioners give. I've just listed some with family. So that's on the plus side of the balance sheet. So there's one million pensioners or so in Scotland. And the white paper has made it plain they will receive their state pensions as now on time and in full. And in the event of a yes vote, a full overhaul of pension age, yes, and also the pension and benefits. Because I heard what the member had to say about uh, the pensions and the pension credit. I see, I think pension credit's a disgrace. I don't think people should have to apply for a pension credit to bring themselves up. We should have a decent basic state pension from the start. And as from the 6th of April 2016, new pensioners will receive, if we're independent, a single tier pension of £160 per week. Because the fact is that 30% of those entitled to the pension credit don't claim it. They never have. It's bewildering. The forms are difficult. So let's get rid of the pension credit. Let's give pensioners a decent pension from the start. Yes. Neil Finlay. If the member will advise us then, what was John Swinney on about in his famous leaked uh, memo to the Cabinet when he raised these issues himself, saying there would be a black hole in an independence? These, these have been dealt with ad nauseum. But I want to go back to Labour's track record, because you, the member, referred to a track record. Now, Gordon Brown, the man of the moment, has a track record on pensions. In 2000, Gordon Brown announced he was raising petrol tax and pensions in line with inflation, but failed to explain that he was using 3.3% for petrol and just 1.1% for pensions. The result was a basic rise of 75p per week. No wonder 10 million pensioners were up in arms. Let me finish this bit. But he had previous form, alluded to by Sandra White. In 1997, he changed the advanced corporation tax of private pension funds. The effect was that took 5 billion a year out of those funds, now 10 billion a year. And of course, the result is people who contracted into those pension funds are getting less of a pension. So, you know, we need no lessons about that. And the thing, there are very few advantages in being, uh, getting on in here. But I've been here 15 years. And I have to say to the Labour benches, free personal care, I remember people on the Labour benches who resisted that. And it was the one thing, I'll give you credit for this, the Liberal Democrats, as part of the coalition, you managed to get Labour to change its tune and the whole Parliament voted for it. With regard to concessionary bus fares, you spent your time before the last Scottish Parliament election telling people we were thinking of getting rid of them. So we're not. No way are they getting there. A health, a social asset. So you've got form. Winter fuel allowance. Who started the whole thing about a winter fuel allowance in Scotland, bet you don't know. Margaret Ewing did when she was an MP at Westminster long Order, before please. anybody else ever thought about it. So the difference between me and the Labour benches is I remember history as it happened, not revisionist history that you hope happened. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you uh, very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. And may I, like uh, Christine Graham, apologise for being uh, a part of the demographic uh, challenge that Labour uh, Party have identified. There are one or two others of us may yet be speaking uh, in, this, uh, in this debate. It's, um, it's interesting how we started the debate with a reference to grandparents. Well, I uh, have the misfortune to have not known any of my grandparents. Indeed, all my grandparents were born before the first secret ballot in the parliamentary elections, which took place on the 15th of August 1872. Indeed, when my uh, paternal grandfather was born, Abraham Lincoln was uh, president. And I think many of my generation have less connection with grandparents than others because we were born immediately after the war, 
to parents that were a bit older because our dads uh, had been away in the war. Uh, so we probably experienced less uh, grand parental nurturing uh, than uh, many uh, did. But of course, the subject of pensions is one that's been around a long time. It was Lloyd George who introduced them. Um, they were half a crown a week, eh, half a crown a month, I beg his pardon, um, when they were introduced. And this was thought to be such a revolutionary and huge financial bonus that uh, in the book Parahandi's Tales, Parahandi contemplated starting pensioner farms to exploit the amount of money. He could keep a few healthy pensioners on a Scottish island somewhere and he would make huge profits out of it. But of course, pensions have been around for quite a long time. My uh, great-great-grandfather, um, Andrew Barlow, who was uh, a, a soldier in the Napoleonic Wars, ended up as a Chelsea pensioner because he went deaf. And my great-great-great-grandfather, when he left the Navy in 1782, uh, got a pension. But it's only in modern times, really within the memory of people or people we know almost that the universal pension came along. And that is why the intervention of Gordon Brown uh, to basically take away some of the tax benefits that had been in pension funds uh, was so catastrophic and is part of the reason why people I know uh, have actually got to the position where their private pensions were wiped out and are zero. And that was on the Labour Party's watch. But I want to say, the Labour Party do good things. They have done very many good things. Uh, for example, the anti-smoking legislation, which took great courage in this Parliament, I absolutely commend the Labour Party for. The introduction uh, of the bus pass scheme, which benefits old people, but also sustains the bus network in rural areas. Two benefits... Uh, from each pound that spent there. The Labour Party were behind the introduction of comprehensive education, which I strongly uh, support. So the Labour Party have done many good things. The Labour Party in West Lothian have done many good things. Although I do remember it was Jimmy McGinley uh, in, I think, 1980, uh, who introduced the Christmas bonus for pensioners uh, rather than the Labour Party. So we've been around, we've had quite a lot of good things from the Labour Party. It's so disappointing, therefore, to see the prospect, simply by putting into the debate of things for change, for reduction, for containing costs, that there is a perception, and the Labour Party have every opportunity to put this perception to one side and tell us now or at a later point that there is no threat to these benefits that the Labour Party contributed to bringing to Scotland through the operation of the Scottish Parliament to one side, saying that they're protected, saying that they're things that will be left. Now, are we challenged by the economics of older people in Scotland? Yes, of course we are. There isn't a country in Europe where you cannot say that. The reality is, however, uh, that in fact the costs in Scotland are rather less. The National Institute of Economic and Social Research uh, said our analysis has shown that the costs of state pension would be lower in Scotland for the bad reason that Scotland's lower life expectancy. We want to drive that up. There isn't anybody in this parliament of any political party who wants to do anything different. We only dis dif disagree about means and timing. We don't disagree about objectives. And that's good. Let's try and build on that consensus. We also know that social protection costs uh, are lower in Scotland. Uh, in 2012-13, it was 15.5% of gross domestic product in Scotland, half a percentage point higher in the UK. Uh, that's some 5 or 6% higher. And, of course, our tax revenues in Scotland spent on uh, social protection were 2% lower in Scotland. All opportunities, opportunities, to be able to provide better care for people who require it. But of course, old people are not people who necessarily require care. There are very many fit older people. If you start fit, you can stay fit. 
I remember being in Australia in the 1980s, watching breakfast television. Very sad, but I was. And I saw the guy who just won the Australian over 40s marathon for the 40th consecutive time. <laughs> He was actually in his 90s, and he was beating people in his 40s. And he was fit, and he stood proud and upright. His voice was strong. There was no old man. Because he'd never let himself get unfit at any point in his that's life. Gone, and that's the great trick that uh, Christine Graham and others um, has, well uh, has completely uh, got wrong. Now, <laughs> presiding officer. Let me just uh, draw this to conclusion. Neil Finlay described the challenge that we face in his remarks very well. I thought he did a fine job. He quoted uh, Peter Johnson, who reinforced that, and I agreed with Peter Johnson. But of course, the economic challenges that local government, Scottish government, communities in Scotland face does not stem from this parliament with no control over the macroeconomics of our economy, exactly. no control over the substantial majority of the taxation or expenditure that affects our citizens, but stems from a system which we wish to replace on the government benches. Yes. And solution that's available, the causes are identified, Mr. Finlay, the resolutions are rejected by him. Mr. Finlay has has always come from a position of supporting people who need. And I respect him for that. But he will earn my greater respect if he understands that there is an opportunity mm -hmm. to do things differently in an independent Scotland and that we should take that opportunity and do what Mr Finlay so earnestly what? desires. Thank you. Ken McIntosh to be followed by Aileen McLeod. Thank you, President Officer. And can I join all of those who have welcomed the publication of the Active and Health Ageing Plan? And can I add my thanks to Dr Horisky and her team for their work in putting the report together? And I want to echo the comments already made about the important role that older people play in our communities, including, if I may, also highlight uh, by a number of allegedly or self-styled senior citizens in this chamber, in this parliament. <laughs> As I will go on to argue, I think it's only right that our representation reflects that wider society. The Action Plan makes a number of very helpful recommendations, which I'm pleased the government has endorsed. And I like the way it is framed, not as a passive process, but as a process of active ageing, one which we can shape together as a society. I think the phrase that Dr Whisky used in her foreword was, ageing healthily, which I think neatly sums up the purpose of the plan, and I had rather naively hoped this debate too. Uh, and, of course, in many ways, old is a relative term. In his retirement, my own father uh, used to regularly tell us about his visits to so-called older people, to which we would point out they're a lot younger than he was. And a friend and constituent, Marie Galbraith, who sadly died last year, but who well into her 70s and then into her 80s, did so much to shape the Parliament's title conditions bill a decade back. She once told me that old is 10 years older than you are, uh, or the refined version, 10 years is older, 10 years is, sorry, it's 10 years older than you think you are. My feeling, we've had examples of failing memory already, Christine, so, Christine Graham, so. But there are vulnerabilities which go with age too, as you've, I've just demonstrated, and which simply can't be ignored. Not just infirmity or declining physical strength, but problems such as increasing loneliness and social isolation, which my colleague Margaret McDougall brought forward for debate just last month. Technology moves on, which can be liberating for some, but which can become a barrier for others. And this is where we have to act. This is what we have to respond to, these new challenges. Governments and the Scottish Parliament have to intervene to make sure we are putting in place the right protections. A bump in the car for someone older can become a source of anxiety rather than something to be forgotten about and turns into a reason not to drive anymore. For us as parliamentarians, that should mean ever more reason to support the free bus pass so that those who choose not to drive do not lose their mobility. The confidence which comes from maturity and experience from a life of work or bringing up a family can begin to wane. And this is an opening in which fraudsters and scam artists thrive. For us as elected representatives, this is a growing threat. We need to respond, helping to protect vulnerable people from unwanted cold calling and doorstep selling. As MSPs, we're rightly proud of introducing free personal care for older people. But we should be ashamed 
to be in office while older people in Scotland suffer the indignity of the 15-minute care visit. Presiding officer, it is right that we question and debate the costs of our policy choices, but at least as important are the support mechanisms we put in place, the social and cultural attitudes we help shape, and the political voice that we hear from older people. To give just one more example, there are many retirement complexes in my own constituency, and I'm sure across many others. The properties are owned by the residents and they're run by a property manager, but the relationship between owner and manager is often reversed. I don't know how many times I've met residents who feel intimidated or worse, who feel powerless and bullied. Patricia Ferguson's Property Factors Act has for the first time created an avenue for complaint, but from my experience, the jury is certainly still out on whether we need to go beyond a voluntary code of conduct. Presiding officer, as the motion before us highlights, there is much we can celebrate too. Last week, I was delighted to host, along with my Westminster colleague, Jim Murphy MP, an award ceremony for local volunteers in East Renfrewshire. This event was attended by almost 150 people from all walks of life and all ages. It was an uplifting, life-affirming, unsullied demonstration of our common humanity, quite an antidote to the often jaundiced cynicism which too often accompanies politics. And I heard firsthand of so many daily demonstrations of kindness and solidarity, from dementia carers and bereavement counsellors to environmental campaigners and everything else in between. Last year, the Royal Voluntary Service found that one in five older people in the UK, and that's some two and a quarter million people, volunteer for two charities or more. In Scotland, almost one in five people over the age of 75 still volunteer. I do not believe we should have to justify older people in terms of their economic contribution through hours of caring or volunteering, substantial though that is. But a particularly interesting study from University College London last year found that any suggestion of older people being a hindrance to society or a drag on our economy is unfounded. They found that the fact that people are living longer, often categorised as a problem, yes, even by SNP members in this chamber, is actually a net benefit to the economy. Even that is taking into account the increasing health service and social care costs. And part of that net benefit includes the increasingly important role older people play as kinship carers and as foster carers. The fostering network recently analysed a sample of its foster carer uh, members. They found that 23% of all carers in Scotland were aged between 60 and 69, 4% were over 70. The same study discovered that only 6% of carers were aged under 40. Other studies have found similar figures in other caring roles. Bristol University recently found that 54% of children in kinship care were cared for by their grandparents and 23% of kinship carers in Scotland were aged over 65. Now, I was surprised, presiding officer, that that important kinship care role, which I think has remained hugely unappreciated and undervalued for too long, is not mentioned in the action plan. And there's no mention of older people being supported to be carers either. In closing, presiding officer, can I welcome the debate today and welcome the opportunity it gives this Parliament to say with one voice that we enorm enormously appreciate not just the contribution older people have made, but that they continue to make to Scotland. Whether working, caring for others or volunteering in every community, older people are an integral part of holding this country together. And we owe them not just a debt of gratitude, but all the support we can provide to allow each of them and each of us to age healthily. Many thanks. I now call on Aileen MacLeod to be followed by Fiona MacLeod. Uh, seven minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, like my colleague uh, Ken McIntosh, I want to uh, start by welcoming the new action plan on active and healthy ageing in Scotland, Somewhere to Go and Something to Do, which outlines Scotland's vision for its older people to enjoy full and positive lives, happy and healthy at home or in a homely setting. Now, this vision values older people in their contribution to society and seeks to empower them to be active partners in the way support and services are planned and delivered. And it also sets out a number of key actions to be achieved by 2016, built around four key themes that older people have identified as being important to them. Those being that I want to have fun and enjoy myself, I wish to remain connected to my friends, I wish to be able to contribute to society for as long as I want, and don't talk to about me without me and respect my beliefs and values. 
And saying, officer, ensuring that older people do have somewhere to go, something to do and someone to do with is fundamental to achieving better health and wellbeing outcomes. And this is important if we are to confront the demographic changes happening within our society as people live longer. And that more people are living for longer should be welcomed unreservedly as a positive development across society, as other speakers have already said. But we must also recognise that that in itself does bring new challenges, and it's challenges to ensure that individuals have a good quality of life in their later years, and challenges to ensure that we are able to support those of our citizens who will find themselves in need of key public services as they grow older, and that we must ensure that we can meet those challenges and deliver those services in ways that best suit what are often complex needs of individuals, and whenever possible, to do so in the most appropriate physical setting. Now, legislating for the integration of health and social care services, as this Parliament did back in February, and as recommended by the Christie Commission, will go some way towards ensuring Scotland's older population can indeed attain an acceptable quality of life at home and in their own communities through joined up delivery of services that are firmly integrated around the needs of the individuals, their carers and their families. And one key issue, planning officer, that I would like to mention is the important role that housing has to play in empowering older people to live independently. And I'd like to thank uh, the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations for the briefing that they provided us with ahead of today's debate. Now, providing services for the elderly is a key activity for Scotland's housing associations and cooperatives, and their involvement in the delivery of older people's services is growing, especially in the area of care and repair, where they are providing uh, often local, personal, preventative services, such as combating social isolation through befriending, through exercise, physical fitness, and arts projects, as well as, well as various day-to-day uh, -day handyman services. So I therefore welcome this government's recognition of the key role that housing has to play in improving the health and well-being outcomes of our citizens, not least in the policy commitment to enable our older people to be cared for at home for as long as possible. And I'm also uh, glad that housing stakeholders were added to the list of persons that Scottish ministers must consult before prescribing national outcomes for health and well-being. Now, presiding officer, the region that I represent, uh, Dumfries and Galloway, benefits from a large and active population of older people who are often the driving force behind community activities of all shapes and sizes and who enrich our communities. Now, the breadth and strength of its voluntary sector in Dumfries and Galloway is, in my view, directly related to the proportion of the population who have the benefit of years of experience in their trade or profession and an interest in giving something back to their communities. And whether that be as volunteers who support uh, the Crossroads Newton Stewart and Mackers Care Attendance Scheme in Wigton through a range of services including respite care, personal care, palliative care and assistance with transport and shopping, or our food trained volunteers who make sure that people in their own local communities have enough good quality food to eat in addition to some social interaction as a way in which to try and help the isolations, feelings of isolation. And also the community buyout of the Mulla Galloway, which I was delighted to be involved with, was led by two redoubtable uh, retired couples. And they have given so much back to the community, it would be difficult to imagine what it would look like without their involvement. Now, presiding officer, older people do indeed make a massive contribution to Scottish society and to our economy as we've heard earlier, both from Nanette Milne and from Ken McIntosh, and they continue to make a valuable contribution to Scottish society. And the Scottish Government has an approach which not only values that contribution, but is determined to support it to the fullest extent possible within the powers that we currently have. So, officer, in closing, this Parliament's record on protecting the income of older people, whether it be by continuing the council tax freeze for the seventh year in a row, providing free personal and nursing care for our elderly citizens or concessionary bus travel for our over 60s or introducing the energy efficiency measures to help us tackle the scandal that is fuel poverty. It demonstrates, this demonstrates that our decisions about Scotland are best made in Scotland. And the only way, presiding officer, I am if actually you like, if you concluding want to. on my last sentence, but the only way to protect these gains for our older people is by 
voting yes on September the 18th. And I support the motion in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Thanks so much. Now I call on Fiona MacLeod to be followed by Hugh Henry, a generous seven minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to speak as the constituency MSP for Strathkelvin and Bears Den with one of the fastest rising populations of older people in the whole of Scotland. And indeed, a friend of mine who's a consultant in Greater Glasgow Health Board told me that there's a few streets in Bears Den where we have the fastest rising population of older people in the whole of Western Europe. A testament to how well we have lived our lives in our early years and continue to live them in our later years. Indeed, in the constituency next door to me, in my next door town, Mogai, there are more centenarians in Mogai than anywhere else in Scotland. And my late father-in-law only missed being a centen centenarian by six weeks um, uh, two years ago. Now, there's an example of an older person who continued to contribute to society and his community until he was 99 and a half and slayed by a heart attack at that stage. Uh, my father-in-law was the oldest man in Scotland at the time to receive a certificate for uh, learning in computer technology. He was 89 at the time. Uh, a man who ran his residence association in his sheltered housing uh, association, I think, until he was in his 90s. Um, quite an amazing man. Certainly. Mr Stevenson. Um, I think it was about 15 years ago that uh, someone in England um, completed their pilot's licence at the age of 82. So there are no limits to the heights to which we can aspire. <laughs> Correct. Well, I, I was just content. I was content that my father-in-law was a silver surfer, not too sure that I'd have been happy with him being a silver flyer. Towards the end, we weren't sure that he should have been a silver driver, but there we are. Um, I, I thought it was interesting listening to Ken McIntosh's speech because his constituency is very much, very similar demographics to mine. How much the structure of my speech is, is, was reflected in, in uh, Ken McIntosh's contribution. And it, it cannot be denied that um, a growing elderly population can bring challenges for services. But what I want to use the rest of my speech for is to talk about all the expertise that the growing older population brings. For Strakelvin and Bears Den, these older people bring an enormous number of volunteers, they bring carers, they bring activists in the community, and they bring spenders. And I think that's an important point. And Nanette Milne made that in, in her opening speech, because research by the Scottish Government in 2009 and the research by RVS in 2011 that Nanette Milne quoted, and I think it's worth repeating, that older people make a net financial contribution to Scottish society or, or UK society of £40 billion per annum. And I think we should remember that whenever we talk about the demographic demographic challenges, the older people's time bomb. They, they are a, um, an area, a, a group of people who spend a lot. They spend over what they cost society. In terms of carers, 21% of over 65 year olds support their parents, their parents, their partners and their children as carers. And 65% of older people help their elderly neighbours to remain safe in their, in their homes, in their communities. These are things that we need to remember and we need to celebrate and we need to recognise. And of course, as carers, and it's been mentioned already by the Cabinet Secretary and others, the, the older people are also the carers to the next generations. They brought up their own children and 51% of families in Scotland say that they have asked their, the grandparents to be the child carers. That's a saving of £660 million per annum across Scotland. And when I was looking at that statistic, I think it was from Age Scotland, it reminded me of my own time uh, as, as when my son was young 23 years ago. It was through my mum being able to, to look after my son that I was able to continue volunteering with Marie Curie Cancer Care at their hospice when I'd set up their library and was able to continue to be a volunteer. I couldn't have done that if my mum hadn't been able to look after my son. And I have to say there were many times pushing my pram around Bearsden Cross and Mogai Town Centre 
where I thought that I it felt that I was the only person pushing a pram that didn't have grey hair. There were so many grandparents in my area supporting their children to be able to go out to work by looking after their grandchildren. And then, of course, there's the figures on older people as volunteers. 42% of volunteers are aged over 50 years. Again, a very significant number that we should bear in mind when talking about older people. And Ken McIntosh was talking about being at his Carers Awards. I was delighted to uh, be at the Eastern Bartonshire Volunteer Action uh, You're Our Hero Awards last Friday. Now, I was invited along to give the award to the Young Volunteer of the Year, which I was delighted to do. But our Volunteer of the Year was a man called Martin Brickley, a retired teacher. Now, he calls himself a retired teacher, but he's certainly not retired from life and active commi co commitment to his community. Can I just read out a wee list of what Martin Brickley is, has been up to in the last year? He's a board member of the Public Partnership Forum. He's a member of the Change Fund Transformational Group, and he's the secretary of Kirkintilloch and District Seniors Forum. There's a man who hasn't retired from life, even if he's retired from teaching. And Martin won the award, and when he won the award, I, I just thought it was important to quote Martin's own words. The benefits I derive from volunteering are the enjoyment from actively participating in my local community, meeting new people and exposure to new experiences. Older people should volunteer because it makes a massive difference as to how they feel and to what they provide for the wider population. It also means they require less health care and general supporting by being active and feeling useful. Wise words from Martin Brickley. But, you know, when I went through the brochure, Pat Brown, who volunteers with Telephone Prevent Befrienders, um, with the knitting group, with Eastern Bartonshire Voluntary Action as a volunteer officer. Her quote was lovely. It's not just a one-way street, you get your own glow back, says Pat, which I thought was a lovely thing to say. Um, best one of all, perhaps, Winnie Findlay, 94 years old. She's part of the um, Will Be Our Volunteer. She's been knitting a um, for Samaritan's Purse, shoebox appeal for many, many years. Now, Winnie just went into a care home a few months ago, but vowed that she would keep on knitting and keep on doing her volunteering. So my community has an enormous number of older people who are actively volunteering. Just two more to mention. Um, Nan Middleton at Creative Care, who last year won the Queen's Award for Voluntary Services and the Anan Bavan Cultural Centre in Kirkintilloch. You might wish to start winding up any moment. Sorry? I wish to start winding up now. I certainly will. So I just wanted to make absolutely clear that in this debate that we recognise all the many achievements and that we celebrate and support all that older people can do. And I have to say, in conclusion, that Scotland's older people deserve better than the carping that we've had from the opposition in this debate they need to get real. The UK is eroding through welfare cuts, through changes to pension ages, through widening the inequality gap. The so it's about fighting now, to make sure that Scotland's older people continue to get the services that they deserve. Thank you. Many thanks. Now Colin Hugh Henry to be followed by Bob Doris. A generous seven minutes, Mr Henry. Uh, thank you, President Officer. There is no doubt that this generation that inhabits this parliament has a debt of gratitude to our older people, and not just to the, the current generation of older people, but to those who went before. Stuart Stevenson, I think, generously acknowledged the contribution made on many issues by the Labour Party. But it wasn't just the Labour Party. Over many generations, it was the organised labour and trade union movement who decided that they were not going to stand for the kind of conditions that pertained in 20th century Britain in the, in, in the early part of that century. And it was through their struggles, through their endeavours, through agitation and through action, and indeed having fought a war, um, the Second World War, that they decided that they would change the country for the better. They wanted to make sure that their children and grandchildren had the opportunities that they never had. 
And it's because of those struggles, because of their determination, that I, like many others in this parliament, was the first in my family to be able to go to university. It was because of their contributions and struggles that I and many others were able to take for granted free health care. And it was through their struggles that, unlike my granny that had to live in a room and kitchen with an outside toilet, that her children and her grandchildren were able to aspire to decent houses. So when we look at that contribution, and Stuart Stevenson mentioned comprehensive education, there are a whole list of historical things that organised lab the Labour and Trade Union movement delivered for this country. They helped to define Britain in the 20th century and into the 21st century. And because of that, I think that we owe them something. We should thank them, but not just with words. We should thank them with our actions for everything that they did to give us the best possible start in life. Now, Fiona MacLeod said that all she's heard from the opposition today was carping, and far from it. Because I think that particularly in the Labour benches and for a period when we were in coalition with the Lib Dems, there were a number of things that we delivered in this parliament when the money was flowing. We delivered as others have said, the free personal care. We delivered the free transport. We delivered a whole range of things. And it's right to do that. And the challenge is not to see older people as the challenge. Because they, as Nanette Millen and others have said, they are not a burden. They are an asset to our society. But the challenge is for us and our generation to find the means, to find the money, to make sure that they are able to live their retirement with dignity and with pride. Now, in saying that, that will mean that we have to make choices as a society. There is no doubt about it, because everything cannot be delivered to everybody irrespective of the consequences. And as other speakers have said, the ageing population, the demographic profile changing, means that more and more older people are relying on fewer, fewer younger people to pay for their retirement. Now, how do we then meet that challenge? Because if we aspire to repay the debt that we owe to that older generation, then we should aspire, yes, to look at decent pensions. There is no doubt about it. We should aspire to make sure that the money is there to pay for those pensions. So therefore it is right to have a debate about how we pay for those pensions and what we can afford. Because the last thing that we want to do is to make irresponsible promises that can never be delivered. And older people are wise enough to know that. And similarly, when we come to, um, we heard about housing and care, then it's not enough to say that people in later life who need the care uh, deserve it. We have got to show that the quality care is there for them in their time of need. And one of the things that is apparent, not just in my constituency in Renfrewshire Council, but right across the country, is that we are not building enough specialist homes, homes that are very sheltered housing, homes that are sheltered housing. We are not building enough houses that are appropriate to the needs of that older generation, if many of them, like Fiona MacLeod, are living to near enough 100. So that is a challenge for us, because up until now, we have made a choice in this parliament. We have decided that the money will not be available just now for all the homes that are necessary. That's a choice that we have to make. I think it's a wrong choice because those older people need those homes now. And similarly, they need the care. They need the flexible care. And Ken McIntosh and others have mentioned, you know, what is happening about people coming in and going out quickly, not being able to sustain uh, the, the proper level of care. And it is most obvious 
most obvious for those with dementia. Because while there are one or two initiatives in this country that actually are fantastic in the way that they deliver care, we are closing our eyes to the problem that is confronting this society with the growing numbers of dementia. They are not a burden. They are not a challenge. They are simply members of our families that need a particular type of care. And the dementia services need to be reshaped, rejigged and retooled. So when Sandra White and others start to talk about the Labour Party threatening to take things away, nothing could be further from the truth. What we are attempting to do is to face up to how we pay for everything that we want to deliver for our older people. Because what they, de what they demand and what Members they deserve last minute. is honesty, is sensible pro policies. And they will not take kindly to glib promises being made for the purposes of a referendum or an election. They are wanting to see action and they deserve nothing less. Many thanks. I now call on Bob Doris, after which we we'll move to closing speeches. Thank you very much, President Officer. It's um, been, been an interesting debate. Um, there's been uh, little consensus other than to say that I think we all genuinely and sincerely believe that uh, an ageing population should be celebrated, not seen as a burden, that uh, we all have to work together in partnership to make, make the quality of life, not just living longer, but the quality of life of our older people to be as positive as possible. So there has been consensus, even if our solutions on how to achieve that uh, have not been consensual. I might say a little bit about the affordability of, of, of pensions. It is worth noting that uh, in terms of social protection, so that's all the monies that Scotland spends, and not just pensioners, but those that are unemployed and disability and everything else, that 42% of Scottish revenues, I understand, goes towards social protection, but on a UK basis, it's 43%. I would give that figure because some have suggested that uh, pensions will be less affordable within independent Scotland. That figure would make it suggest as if it's more affordable within an independent Scotland. And given that's been part of the debate, that's important to put on the record. I'd also like to put on the record in terms of gross domestic product for the year 12-13 that 15.5% of Scotland's gross domestic product was spent on that form of social protection. Uh, but in the UK, it was a higher level at 16%. So I think uh, in terms of affordability, currently with uh, pensions, um, we, we, we can quite clearly say it is more affordable in Scotland than it is across the rest of the UK. That's just a factual situation that I think we should all just learn to accept. We can also now accept as well that the DWP have confirmed that the state pension has a, has a cast iron uh, guarantee within an independent Scotland. The only thing we're arguing about now is whether it will increase higher for new pensioners in Scotland than other people in the UK. And that's not a bad position to be in within any debate. And we also know because of the contractual arrangements that occupational and private pensions are safe for pensioners within independent Scotland. And that's an important thing uh, for our older population. So what we're really talking about, if we're talking about the increase of the UK retirement age. Now, we're not talking about making club promises to Scottish pensioners, because if an independent Scotland doesn't increase the retirement age, what we're saying is we promise not to make things worse for Scottish pensioners, because the UK intends to make things worse for Scottish pensioners. That's just a factual situation. Uh, I think, uh, well, Mr Hume. Thank Give you. you. I thank Bob Doris for taking the intervention. You've just said that uh, uh, Westminster are, are, are focused on making things worse for Scottish pensioners, but we've seen the biggest rise in pensions, uh, triple locked, uh, worth some £800 per pensioner, uh, around 890,000 pensioners in Scotland. That's uh, not making things worse for, Scotland, for Scottish pensioners. That's making it a lot better. I, would, I, would, I, think, I think I would say to Mr Hume, by uh, increasing the retirement age for, for Scottish pensioners isn't making things better for them, it's making things worse for them. And e every independent observation of the UK strategy in supporting pensioners, if things have got worse under the Condemn Coalition, I think that's reasonable to put on the record. So what does it mean for, for, for my constituents? Well, actually, we've heard about uh, how it will affect women. Uh, reaching 65 uh, under the current uh, pension plans, they're likely to gain, or sorry, likely to receive £11,000 less 
over the course of the retirement because of poorer life expectancy uh, in Scotland. But as a Glasgow MSP, it's reasonable for me to put on the record that for males in Glasgow, on average, because of course we've heard some males in Glasgow live, li live to a ripe old age and are hale and hearty for a long time, but on average a male in Glasgow will receive £29,000 less in old age vis-à-vis -vis people in elsewhere in the UK. Now, all I would say to you, presiding officer, is if we have the power to stop that inequality happening, why wouldn't we take that power to this parliament and why wouldn't we deliver for Scotland's pensioners? We can have that power with an independence referendum. Yes, vote. For goodness sake, can we just deliver for my constituents, male people in Glasgow, who are getting £29,000 less during the course of retirement because of life expectancy. Now, I would like to have a nice problem, uh, presiding officer. I would like the problem to be that in a few years' time we have to review all this because life expectancy in Scotland dramatically improves, and that's the agenda we're all on. So I'm not celebrating the fact that life expectancy in Scotland is poorer than the rest of the UK. I want to improve it. I would like to have to have the difficult situation that a UK government has to make because of increasing life expectancy. I would like to be in that position, but it is not so in Scotland. So what I would say to the Labour Party is the working class males of Scotland, particularly in Glasgow, who work hard all their life and pay into a pension pot they will never receive because of poor life expectancy. We can fix that and we should fix that, quite frankly. Now, I just want to say a couple of things about uh, uh, the way things are just now. Some, some positive things about the NHS in Scotland, which obviously our older population use more than than any other group, because I actually think, uh, in relation to Mr Finlay's call for, for, for a fundamental root and branch review of the NHS, I think it misses the, the, the trick completely in relation to how the NHS operates. And I actually think the Conservatives, um, I don't often uh, compliment the Conservatives, but I think they're rather well balanced in relation to how you have an NHS under continuous review. Uh, and that is something that happens consistently across Scotland's national health service. Yes, absolutely. Neil Finlay. Does he accept the view that I have heard consistently from nurses, from doctors, from patients, from all stakeholders in the NHS, that the NHS in Scotland is under more pressure than it's ever been in its history? Bob Doris. Well, th th that's like saying if you put your hand in the fire, your hand will get burned, because the Scottish NHS is doing more operations than ever before. Demand in the Scottish NHS is increasing like like never before, and that is why the Scottish NHS is evolving. Uh, what I would say to Mr Finlay is, let, OK, let, the time I have left, let's pick one positive thing that Mr Finlay would, would, would not wish to recognise, and that is Scotland's patient safety programme since 2008. We have seen a mortality fall uh, by 12.4% in Scotland's NHS. That's a good thing. That's 8,500 people predominantly older people, Mr Finlay, who are alive today because of Scotland's world-leading patient safety programme. I apologise, President Officer, please. I seem to have got uh, sidelined into a tangential situation, but if I can just say from my, uh, not for the first time I have to say, uh, but if I can just say from my own personal experience of my friends and my family who are in their late 60s and 70s, and I see what local authorities are trying to do for them, and I see what Scotland's NHS are trying to do with them, by and large, the quality of care in both our NHS and local authorities is exceptional and second to none. Yes, there are problems and they have to be fixed. And I think health and social care integration and the Change Fund for Older People are two major levers to do that. But quite frankly, the As major close, lever we please. need is the power of independence, presiding officer, and I think that's a good point in which to leave it. Thanks very much. And we now move to closing speeches and I call on Jim Hume, seven minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we can hardly say that this has been a consensual debate, but it has been a very welcome debate. We've had Stuart Stevenson enrich the debate with his personal family experiences, a tactic new to uh, Stuart Stevenson, I'm sure. Kristen Green has uh, enriched the debate with uh, visions of her attire in the 60s. And Fiona McLeod's enriched the debate by uh, going on about ca carping opposition MSPs in their in their uh, contributions and then carping on about uh, other governments. The government and the parliaments quite right to uh, celebrate the contribution older people bring to our society. It's absolutely correct that they should highlight concessionary bus travel and free personal care, care as ways of recognising the contribution older people have made throughout their lives and into the future. 
Both these policies, as mentioned, were introduced by the Lib Dem coalition previous to this government, but concessionary fares are being more funded by the bus operators now than by the government. I'm glad that the Nanette Milne also took this opportunity to highlight the disparity that we have in Scotland in our, motion, our amendment and that community buses aren't included in the concessionary fare scheme. It was the subject of one of my own members' debates not so long ago. Many of our rural parts of Scotland don't have the privilege of standard bus routes. Uh, therefore, why can it be fair in those areas our older people have to pay full amounts for their travel? Across this chamber, I think we need to find a solution for this unfairness. Again, Labour have raised their wish for a review of the NHS in Scotland. Now, I recognise that our NHS staff are hardworking and are appreciated for what they do day in and day out. I don't agree that we need to put improvements on hold whilst there is a full review. Instead, we should be focusing on improving the health service where we know that there are problems, a and &E waiting times, getting the balance right between the number of beds available for geriatric patients to the emergency geriatric admissions, and importantly, addressing the health inequalities in Scotland. 90% of those experienced delayed discharges being over 65 address the, address the concerns of Mental Welfare Commission on treatment of dementia patients. Hardly a record of celebrating our old, older people. Sorry, Doris. I, I, I agree with the, the member in relation to the need for the, the, the so-called, I think, tokenistic root and branch reviews outlined by, by the Labour Party. In terms of accident emergency units, as the member mentioned, would you accept, as I do, that the £50 million unscheduled care action plan being presented by the Scottish Government is a concrete example of an NHS under caution review and developing to meet the demands placed upon it? I, I, welcome, I welcome that in investment. Uh, unfortunately, that investment was from an uh, underspend of money. It wasn't new money, uh, as we all know. And we all know that it's going to take a lot more than just um, a, a few extra consultants. And I'm happy to work, as, as uh, Alex Neil knows, uh, with him on, on that. Um, neither is using the fact that we have a lower life expectancy in Scotland, I think, compared to the rest of the UK, as a campaign weapon to promote independence. This government should be better focusing their efforts on narrowing the health inequalities we have compared to the rest of the UK and narrowing the health inequalities within Scotland. Not one local area in Scotland featured in the top fifth of those areas with the highest life expectancy at birth, according to the Office of National Statistics. Only three quarters of Glaswegian boys born today are expected to reach their 65th birthday. And in some areas of Dundee, life expectancy for a male is 10 years worse than in that own city's West End. Presiding officer, this is an echo from Dickensian times that has no place in a modern Scotland. I must make some uh, progress. Apologies. Presiding officer, my amendments highlights many of the areas this government can do better, but it also highlights what Lib Dems have done in coalition. 890,000 890, pensioners in Scotland have already benefited from the new triple lock guarantee recently introduced with pe regarding pensions for the first time ever. That will be an increase by either earnings, inflation or 2.5%, whichever is the highest. 890,000 pensioners, around £800 each better off per year. £712 million back into the pockets of our pensioners in this last year in Scotland alone. That's what I call celebrating our older people. We've tackled age discri uh, discrimination in the workplace also, which will allow those who want to, to work past their 65th birthday. That's valuing someone with a life's experience. That's a way to celebrate our older people. We've had a, one of our mildest winters for some time, but even still the coalition has almost tripled the cold weather payments from 850 to 25 pounds a week, it's a significant rise when money is short. Last year, that resulted in £146 million going to older people to tackle winter cold. Presiding officer, the government motion mentioned the expert advisory groups and the recommendation to increase carers' allowance by £575 per annum. That is welcome and can be done with or without independence. But the Scottish people are still in the dark regarding set-up costs, including those welfare recommendations. Therefore, I repeat the calls for the government to be open and transparent as possible and publish their independence costs in, uh, to include their set-up costs, transition costs and also their welfare recommendations. 
Presiding officer, I said that the debate wasn't consensual, but it is welcome. We should and do celebrate our older people. And why shouldn't we? We're all going that, en uh, that way anyway. We do have a vested interest. Others mentioned a growing ageing population. That's true, but it's not all areas of Scotland that we are ageing so well, as I've highlighted. Health inequalities need to be of the past, not of our future, and this government would do well to concentrate its efforts on addressing that. Geriatric beds at a 10-year low, a damning report from the Mental Welfare Commission. Contrast that with that extra £712 million in the pockets of pensioners in Scotland, delivered already despite uh, Bob Doris's assertions, and not uh, just recognised by any of the, and not recognised by one of the administration MSPs as the biggest ever increase Roger, close, of our please. state pension. 890,000 pensioners better off already in Scotland, delivered within the United Kingdom. A positive case to vote no and stay in the UK in 90 days, 99 days' time. Thanks very much. And we now call on Jackson Carlaw. Seven minutes, please, Mr uh, Carlaw. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have to say I came to Parliament today with a heavy heart, anticipating that this debate would be one of the most ghastly I had ever participated in. <laughs> and I have to say my fears have largely been founded. Uh, can I say of the Cabinet Secretary, whilst I wouldn't apply these adjectives to her, to her motion, it was tawdry, sour, full of rancid SNP polemic, thoroughly depressing, as was much of the debate, notwithstanding contributions that I much appreciated from the Net Milne, Ken McIntosh, until the polemic at the end from Aileen MacLeod, from Fiona MacLeod, from Hugh Henry as well. And yes, I think we've commented, first of all, on the fact that we celebrate old people, which is the opening part of the motion, I think, is something with which we can all agree. Uh, yes, we had various pensioner contributions from the floor this afternoon. And as I pointed out in an earlier debate, when this parliament first assembled in 1999, only eight members were aged 60 or over. The, at the present time, there are over 45 members who are age 60 or over. So this parliament is a reflection of the wider society and its ageing. And I listened to Shona Robeson's rebuttal to Neil Finlay, in which I almost understood the logic of her point to be that had Scotland been independent, there would have been no deindustrialisation in Scotland uniquely in the Western world. It wouldn't have happened. Nor when I hear uh, Bob Doris and others go on about this new referendum, uh, this new pensioner commitment, do I ever remember the SNP talking about reducing the pensionable age in Scotland because we had a different rate of life expectancy? No, this great idea that we're going to have a variable pension, it just only popped into the public lexicon because we have a referendum in prospect and they see it as something they can dangle before the electorate in some elusively bright Way. You know, when I was born, people expected to live about 11 years in retirement. Today, it's about half as much again. And I think most people understand that if we are going to have a much higher and larger and wider base of people surviving into old age, we need a sustainable financial footing in which to place that. And that, however much we might wish it otherwise, does require uh, the pension age to be reviewed. General Robeson that the modelling that was done um, that led to the um, increase in the pension age being accelerated was based on life expectancy in the south of England, not on life expectancy in Scotland. Surely what we need is a model that suits Scottish circumstances. As I said to the Cabinet Secretary, she could have been arguing this for the last 30 years as a, as a reason for reducing the pension age in Scotland, but she hasn't. But the point surely is in all of this, are people going to live well in old age? Are they going to be healthy? And are they going to be living in housing that is appropriate? And these two points were touched on in the course of the debate. And I just want to touch on them in my own way. First, in relation to living well, that actually means that we have to ensure that the health care that is going to keep people fit and independent into old age is readily available. Now let's talk about arterial fibrillation, something Margaret McCulloch, I think, has asked questions on of the government. It's an arrhythmia present in around 1% of the population. It's characterized by an irregular heartbeat and is associated with symptoms such as palpitations, chest pain, breathlessness, and dizziness. 
The prevalence is strongly associated with age, with over 8% of people aged 65 or over, or 85% of people aged 65 or over uh, it being apparent. It's been becoming more common, it's associated with an elderly population, and if not properly treated, compromises the standard of living and ability to act independently of those old people. And yet the drug which is now available is only being uh, prescribed, despite having been approved by the SN uh, SMC, on a variable ratio across Scotland, but as Margaret McCulloch established, only an average of 0.5% of the Scottish population. Now, all of this suggests to me that if we are going to have a health service which is appropriate and competent for elderly people going forward. We currently have too many health boards and too many health medical prescribing committees. And I think that one thing we'll have to look at is providing something that is more streamlined and appropriate and rapid and free thinking. The second area is on housing that uh, Hugh Henry touched on. Now, Mr McIntosh contributed to the debate. He represents the constituency of Eastwood, sometimes known as Eastwood twinned with McCarthy and Stone, uh, because it does have <laughs> such a high concentration of McCarthy and Stone facilities. Indeed, when I first stood for election there, I established that there were 63 residential homes at that time for old people in the constitution. I, I went round them all, and I have to say there are some I didn't want to find myself in, and others that I very much hoped I might find myself in. I did happen to notice that actually very few of them had men full stop. It does seem to be that men don't live just as long as women, and indeed Carlo men are not long lived at all. So I do all this and completely altruistic because I don't expect to be the beneficiary <laughs> of anything about which I speak. But I do think we need to think, and I've touched on this in previous debates, about the accommodation that we are going to provide for older people in this next great age of life. Uh, Hugh Henry talked about this, because of course not everybody is going to be able to go into a McCarthy and Stone facility. They seem to be inordinately expensive to me. We're going to have to ensure that people are able to live within their communities. Now also in East Renfrewshire at the moment there is a proposal for a huge retirement village to be built on the outskirts. Um, I'm not altogether sure whether it's for the benefit of those that will live there or for the benefit of those who are going to manage, run and profit from it. But that's a separate issue. The question is, do we want to create communities into which old people are put or do we want to ensure that older people are able to stay within the communities within which they've lived? And if we accept that people are going to live longer, if we accept that people want to stay within the community and to have an independent lifestyle. Not only do we have to ensure that we have a health service which is capable of allowing them access to staying independent and healthy, we have to start planning now to ensure that the kind of residential accommodation we build in future provides for the sheltered housing Mr Henry talked about, but also appropriate accommodation within a community which an independent, uh, which would allow an elderly person to live in independently. You must close, please. Your time uh, is running I out. Did I say something wrong there? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Presiding officer, this ended up, unfortunately, and I'm so bored with it, frankly, of being yet another debate that referenced everything to the referendum. You know, after September the 18th, we're going to have all of this still ahead of us, whether we're independent or whether we're not, and we really have to start discussing it with a bit more imagination than we managed this afternoon. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, Colin Rhoda Grant, uh, up to eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I welcome the Cabinet Secretary to her new role and also welcome Nanette Milne um, back to this chamber um, and also join with others in paying tribute to her husband for caring for her so well while she was off. But I think we should also uh, pay tribute to the number of older people who are taking on caring roles all the time. People that Fiona MacLeod talked about looking after parents, looking after children and looking after grandchildren and contributing the equivalent of around 34 billion to our country. And this is Carers Week, and I think it's really important that we take this opportunity to celebrate their contribution and thank them for it. And this debate should have been about the contribution of older people. And at the weekend, we saw the commemoration of the D-Day landings. And I think that reminds us all of the sacrifice that that generation made eh, for the rest of us. And then Post-war, they faced a period of huge austerity, but what did they do in the face of that? They set up the welfare state, they set up the NHS, 
selflessly uh, determined to make um, the collective lot better. And Hugh Henry talked about this and said, we owed them a debt of gratitude, which indeed we do. The labour and trade union movements also working together to improve people's law. And indeed, we benefit from that today. And this debate should have been about their contribution. Um, but many contributions indeed have not touched on that at all, which has been disappointing in the debate. Labour have delivered and will continue to deliver for older people. Only a few of those um, things that we have achieved have been mentioned in the government motion. Yet all they do is accuse us of a cuts commission, a figment of their imagination. While they now implement cuts here and now, they make unfunded promises to older people while cutting services here and now. It is the elderly and disabled that face the postcode lottery of services, what they receive and what they pay for. They are the new council tax Payers. These are the stealth cuts made by this government um, and they're implementing them now. They have no com commission. They are implementing them right here and right now. I'll take an intervention. If we imagine the something for nothing culture statement that Joanne Lamont made when she was elected leader, and uh, is the cuts commission not uh, underway? Because that was certainly one of our big peace announcements at the time. Um, Joanne Lamont made it herself. I think we should know where that's at, when it's going to report. Rhoda Grant. Um, the Cuts Commission is a figment of the Minister and indeed her party's um, imagination. But they are the only party that seem to believe that you can deliver Nordic-style services for American-style tax rates. We need to take on the challenge about how we pay for those services and not make the, the least well-off in our society pay for them, as they are doing right here and right now. People are waiting on trolleys. People are getting seven-minute care visits. People are not being looked after as they should be. And that should be a, a, a shame on this government. Can I turn to the issue of free bus passes? And a number of people mentioned this, Nanette Milne, Ken McIntosh, Jim Hume, to name a few, talked about the free bus passes and indeed why they were not maybe available in rural areas where there is no public transport. But there is a form of public transport available in rural areas, and that is the community transport schemes. They're not free, but they are access to public transport, which are valued by older people. However, these are under threat right here, right now, because this government's stealth cuts and the impact on, the, on our older people, keeping them at home and stopping them socialising and getting out to do the very basic things like get to the doctor and get to see um, to do their shopping and I think it's really important that the government tackles this issue and funds those things rather than implementing stealth cuts. Others talked about um, the health service and a and &E, and I think Jim Hume and Neil Finlay um, talked about the disgrace of people um, lying on trolleys for hours on end without knowing when they're going to be seen. Things like bed blocking, where no, people are being boarded out in wards and the like, unacceptable, surely, in this day and age. And that's why we need a beverage-style review. NHS workers are telling me that they have never seen the NHS in such a bad state as it is now. The Cabinet Secretary has admitted there are huge problems with the NHS. All he has said is that they don't need a review. He knows what the issues are. Well, let's see him start address these issues because they're happening at the moment. The NHS is not on hold, as people would accuse us of doing, which is not what we intend. It is actually now in decline. And we in the Labour Party appear to be the only party in this Parliament that can see that and actually want to address it. Tinkering at the edges is not enough. We need a better style review to deal with this. Presiding officer, this debate should have been about the action plan and not many members uh, mentioned it. Those who did welcomed it and I think uh, we would all agree that it is certainly a welcome document to have. But Ken McIntosh mentioned that there was something missing in the action plan and that was the role of kinship carers. And we have a duty to make sure that older people acting as kinship carers are supported emotionally and financially while they provide care for children and young people. Um, Neil Finlay pointed out in the debate that the Labour Party had attempted to change this postcode lottery um, with fin of financial support for kinship carers um, in the Children and Young People Scotland Bill, but the government voted it down. And we have 
Kinship carers in this country, some being paid £40 a week, some being paid £200 a week, and some actually not being paid anything at all. And I think that is an absolute disgrace. We need to support older people in that role who are living off a pension and have no ability to increase their means and are, are bringing up children in, in poverty, and that impacts on those children as well as the people that are doing it. Margaret McCulloch talked about um, the, the need of young people to have access to older people and because um, generations have changed, families move away, that is very difficult to do. And, and she talked about um, initiatives in Germany that were actually helping younger people to have access to older people and learn from them. And I think it's important we do that. We need to deal with, with the challenges that demographic change um, put, put to us. I think we have to plan, and we don't see this government planning to do anything at all about uh, those challenges. While we, while we celebrate that people are living longer, we also have to plan for it to make sure that their lives, lives are worthwhile and that they are not left in their old age afraid and excluded from society, as many, many are. I just want to touch very briefly on a pension age and living longer. I find it quite disgraceful that this government seemed to be saying that our early mortality rates are actually a cost-saving exercise and that we should actually be pleased that this is happening instead of apologising for their failure. This is not something to do with independence because in other parts of the UK they have much better mortality rates than we do. Why are we not doing more with the devolved powers we are rather than bleating from the sidelines and accepting that we have mortality rates that are a disgrace in this day and age? You must close, please. Presiding officer, I, I understand I need to close, um, but I am disappointed that this debate was not more about the contribution made by older people who are living longer and, an, and enjoying health, many of them into old age, and that's a good thing. Our aspiration should be that all people live longer and enjoy good um, health and I think we owe them Finally, that. thank you very much. Now Colin Shona Robertson, uh, you have until five o'clock, Cabinet Secretary. Thanks very much. Um, I wanted to just begin in my closing remarks, apart from thanking everyone for their contribution, just to pay tribute to the Scottish Older People's uh, Assembly, uh, who I meet on a regular basis and, of, of course, who have their, uh, their pensioners meeting in here in October, uh, which is a, a very large um, uh, event and one that's very worthwhile indeed. Uh, can I also say uh, to Sandra White in relation to somewhere to go and something to do, active and healthy ageing, um, an action plan for Scotland. She asked whether there was an opportunity to engage with the cross-party group on older people and to feed into that action plan, and I'm very happy uh, to uh, say yes to that, and um, I'm sure we can arrange that in short order. And, uh, if I could just turn to, to some of the points uh, raised during the debate. I'll try and cover as many of them as possible. Uh, Neil Finlay. Uh, and amongst uh, many things uh, he said, I want to pick up a couple. The social care budgets for older people have actually uh, increased, not decreased, increased by 2.6% between 2013-14 and 14-15, an increase of £34 uh, million. Um, he uh, also mentioned uh, fuel poverty, but of course um, what I should uh, point out, as I did in my, in my opening speech, that we have actually invested uh, more money in tackling fuel poverty. Uh, and of course, that sits uh, by marked contrast uh, to the uh, promises by Ed Miliband to review the winter fuel allowance and uh, has put a question mark on, over its universality. Uh, hopefully, that's not something that Neil Finlay uh, would support. And we've heard throughout this debate about, um, yes, a number of challenges that are facing the NHS. Um, indeed, th there are. The Cabinet Secretary for, for Health and Wellbeing has, of course, brought forward a number of plans to deal with some of those challenging situations. But, you know, to constantly hear from the Labour Party that the answer to every challenge in the NHS is a review just strikes me as being the absence of anything else to say about the NHS, um, because we don't want to put the NHS on pause. We want to get on and solve some of the very challenging uh, issues that there are with the health service 
But I should say at the same time, the health service that actually provides a fantastic service to hundreds uh, or, and thousands of people uh, every day uh, of every week. Nanette Milne, I should uh, um, join with others in paying tribute to Mr Milne. Um, I hope you're going to share with him um, the, the transcript of this debate. Um, but, uh, and she also talked about the importance of volunteering in her own area, as uh, did many others during the debate. Um, Jim Hume mentioned the Mental Welfare Commission uh, report. And of course, um, we have accepted the recommendations of, made by the Commission for, uh, and um, the ones that are for the government and for the NHS have accept, accepted them in full. Next month, the Public Health Minister will present a, an integrated action plan in response to the Mental Welfare Commission's report, which outlines how we'll implement their recommendations. Um, also, he mentioned carers' allowance and said that we could get on and, and increase carers' allowance now. Well, apart from the fact that it's actually reserved to Westminster and is a Department of Work and Pensions uh, allowance, not one that we have here. But yeah, yes, of course. Neil Finn. Welfare Commission. She says that she's accepted the recommendations. Has she checked with the Cabinet Secretary for Health? Because he might actually reject them once you've accepted them. He's got form. Cabinet Secretary. Anyway, as I was saying. Um, Sandra White, moving on to important points made during the debate, unlike that, that last rather silly one. Uh, Sandra White um, made a number of very important points um, and uh, talked about older people absolutely being a, an asset, not a burden. And that was something that was uh, very um, familiar to many people's speeches. Margaret McCulloch similarly said the same. Um, I thought she met, made a very interesting speech and talked about a very innovative project in Germany. Of course, we do have a number of examples here in Scotland of services being brought together under one roof, but without a doubt, the project that she referred to in Germany it seems to have gone one step further than that, and I'm sure we would always want to look at these things uh, in uh, more detail. Um, Christine Graham um, reminded everyone of Gordon Brown's record, um, the 75 pension rise and his raid on pension funds, which people, of course, are still uh, paying for today. Uh, Stuart Stevenson reminded us, of course, that social protection is more affordable in uh, Scotland, and that uh, is important. Ken McIntosh, I thought, made um, a very thoughtful speech, but he did refer to um, the issue of 15-minute visits. And, of course, um, again, the, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing has um, charged Health Improvement Scotland and the Care Inspectorate to develop a new inspections methodology to ensure that people get the level of support that they have been assessed as needing delivered and that the quality is no less uh, than people uh, should uh, expect. New inspections will include the commissioning processes by councils that determine the volume and length of visits needed to deliver safe, compassionate care services for Scotland's older people. So I hope that um, reassures Ken McIntosh. I thought Hugh Henry um, made a very interesting speech, um, one that m much of which I could agree with, apart from his conclusions, um, because he talked about the, the challenge um, for our generation is to make sure that there's adequate resources uh, for those who require those resources and those social protections. Um, but his conclusions seemed to be that that meant that the choices we had to make was to take away from one protection to give to another within the confines of this fixed budget. How much better would it not be to have control over all of the powers, to be able to grow our working age population, for example? to be able to grow our working age population, to increase that tax take, to be able to fund those so social protections, isn't that eminently more sensible than robbing Peter to pay Paul? So I think we can agree on the narrative, uh, Hugh Henry, but the conclusions we absolutely disagree with. Can I thank Jackson Carlo for his kind words? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I've ever been described as tawdry and depressing, but I will always aim to, be, to try 
better to, to not be those things. Uh, but uh, the rest of his speech was, as ever, quite entertaining and humorous. Um, quite self-deprecating, unnecessarily so, I have to say. But he made some good points about housing, and of course, that is why the whole integration of health and social care is so important, because we have to look at things in the round. We have to bring those key pillars of service delivery uh, together, and that's, of course, exactly what we uh, are doing. I mean, Rhoda Grant said, you know, why are we not doing things to tackle life expectancy now? Well, of course we are. A number of the social policies and public health policies this government has, be, has brought forward has been intended to do just that. Not least, of course, tackling Scotland's relationship with alcohol, one of the key causes of life expectancy reductions in too many of our communities. But what we have to ask is why then the Labour Party opposes that policy. When we try to bring in policies to improve life expectancy, you oppose them. That's very disappointing, but maybe not unexpected. I'm just concluding. Maybe not unexpected. So I think it has been, uh, despite it being a robust debate, I think it has overall been an interesting one. So many interesting suggestions and issues to follow up in. I think where we can agree, uh, presiding officer, is that we all want the best for Scotland's older people, but we have very different routes of achieving that. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on celebrating the contribution of older people to Scottish society. We now move to the next item of business, which is decision time. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. Can I remind members that in relation to this afternoon's debate, if the amendment in the name of Neil Findlay is agreed, the amendments in the name of Nanette Milne and Jim Hume fall. The first question, then, is that amendment number 10257.3 in the name of Neil Findlay, which seeks to amend motion number 10257 in the name of Shona Robinson on celebrating the contribution of older people be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10257.3 in the name of Neil Findlay is as follows. Yes, 30. No, 80. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Can I now remind members that if the amendment in the name of Nanette Milne is agreed, the amendment in the name of Jim Hume falls. The next question then is that amendment number 10257.2 in the name of Nanette Milne, which seeks to amend motion number 10257 in the name of Shona Robinson on celebrating the contribution of older people, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10257.2 in the name of Nanette Milne is as follows. Yes, 18. No, 94. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 10257.1 in the name of Jim Hume, which seeks to amend motion number 10257 in the name of Shona Robinson on celebrating the contribution of older people be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament has not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now.
the result of the vote. Amendment number 1025.7.1 in the name of Jim Hume is as follows. Yes, 17. No, 95. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is at motion number 10257 in the name of Shona Robinson on celebrating the contribution of older people be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 10257 in the name of Shona Robinson is as follows. Yes, 64. No, 48. There were no abstentions. The, ma the motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes the decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.